Today, I have a four hour advanced English vocabulary masterclass for you. And by the end of this masterclass, you're going to have all the vocabulary that you need to express your ideas fluently and confidently. Welcome back to J4S English. Of course, I'm Jennifer. Now let's get started. We're going to start this masterclass with phrasal verbs because native speakers love using phrasal verbs. So knowing them will help you sound more fluent, more natural, and they'll help you understand native speakers as well. So in this section, you're going to learn a group of phrasal verbs and then you'll complete a quiz and then you'll move on and learn another group of phrasal verbs. So let's get started with your first group. Number one, to come around to an opinion or an idea. And this means to change your opinion or to see a new point of view. Now notice the sentence structure because we have two prepositions, around and to, and then after to, we need something. We need a noun, an opinion or an idea. For example, I came around to the new job after I heard about the benefits package. So remember, this means you changed your opinion. So previously, you didn't want the new job but now you've come around to it. So you've changed your opinion. Now you want the new job because you heard about the benefits package. We commonly use this without the preposition to and without specifying the something when the something has already been mentioned. For example, at first I didn't want to move to Boston, but I came around after I visited. So notice, I didn't say I came around to something because the something had already been mentioned. So I came around to the idea after I visited. Number two, to get across a point or a message. And this is when you clearly and effectively communicate a point or a message. For example, make sure you get across that the project is over budget. So if you're having a meeting with a client and your boss has this very particular message or idea, the project is over budget and your boss wants you to communicate that in a clear, effective way. Your boss wants to make sure you get that across. Now we also use this when you're talking, you're talking, you're talking, and the ideas aren't really coming out very well, and after a while, you stop and you say, what I'm trying to get across is, and then you state your point. What I'm trying to get across is, the project is over budget. Number three, to show off. This is when you deliberately display your skills or abilities in a way to impress other people. Now this is frequently used in the negative. Don't show off, don't show off. But there's definitely a time and a place when you want to show off. For example, when you're going to a job interview, you shouldn't be modest. You should show off your skills and abilities. You should talk about all your awards, your accomplishments, your degrees, the compliments you've received. You want to show off all of your experience to the interviewer. So an interview is the perfect time to show off. Also, if you're going for your IELTS exam, you don't want to be modest with your knowledge of the English language. You want to show off your abilities by using a range of grammatical structures and a range of phrasal verbs and idioms and expressions. You want to show off to the interviewer. Number four, to count on. Now this is exactly the same as to rely on or to depend on. So you have three different phrasal verbs all with 
on that mean the exact same thing. And this is, of course, when you trust someone or something to complete a specific task or objective. For example, I can always count on Selma to stay late. So you can trust Selma to complete the specific task or objective, which is to stay late. And remember, you could replace this with rely on. I can always rely on Selma or depend on. I can always depend on Selma. Now we frequently use this in a question response. For example, can I count on you? Can I count on you to close the deal? And then you can reply back and say, absolutely, you can count on me. Number five, to come between. Now this is when something disturbs a relationship. And that relationship can be a professional relationship, a social relationship, romantic, family relationship. It can be any kind of relationship. For example, Jacob and Marcus were best friends until Sylvie came between them. So that's the image you could have. They were close, Jacob and Marcus, but then Sylvie came between them and now they're divided. Sylvie disturbed their relationship. Now it's very common for a girl or a guy to come between a relationship, but it doesn't have to be a person. It could be that Jacob and Marcus were very close, but the promotion came between them. The new job came between them. Their family came between them. Their politics came between them. Their religion came between them. It could be anything came between them. Money is a good one as well that comes between people in relationships. And remember, you can use this in any type of relationship. Number six, to put up with something or someone. And notice this is a two preposition phrasal verb, put up with, put up with. And we use this to say that you tolerate bad behavior or unwanted behavior to put up with. For example, I don't know how you put up with your boss. I don't know how you tolerate your boss. Now, of course, we can be more specific and specify the action that the boss does. I don't know how you put up with your boss's constant criticism for example, or your boss's distasteful jokes, for example. I don't know how you tolerate it. Now, we commonly use this to say, I'm not going to put up with, and then the behavior. I'm not going to put up with your constant criticism any longer. Number seven, to bounce back. Now, to bounce back, this is when you recover or recuperate. Now, you can use this when you recover from a negative situation in a business context, like for example, a bad sales quarter or a bad product launch, for example, but it can also be when you recover or recuperate from an illness. So you can use it in both those situations. For example, in a workplace situation, you could say, I don't know how we'll bounce back from our loss in Q2. So I don't know how we'll recover. And then you could have a discussion. How can we bounce back? Does anyone have any ideas on how we can bounce back? Now, in terms of recovering or recuperating from an illness, you could say, it took me a while to bounce back after my surgery. So it took me a while to recover, recuperate. Number eight, to act up. This means to behave badly or strangely. This is very commonly used with parents describing the actions of their young children or even their older children. My son keeps acting up, behaving badly. But we can also use this with 
devices and objects. For example, my computer keeps acting up, behaving strangely. My computer keeps acting up. I hope it doesn't break. Number nine, to make it up to someone. This is quite a long one, so pay attention to this sentence structure. To make it up to someone. Now, we use this when you try to compensate for a wrongdoing. For example, let's say it's your best friend's birthday and you can't go for whatever reason. So this is the wrongdoing, not going to your best friend's birthday party. Now, if you want to compensate for that wrongdoing, you could say, I'm so sorry, I can't make your birthday party. I promise I'll make it up to you. I'll make it up to you by taking you out for a nice dinner. I'll make it up to you by going to the movies with you. I'll make it up to you by buying you a really nice present. So those are the ways you're going to compensate. Now you might be wondering, what is this it? The make it up to someone? We use it with it because what you're trying to compensate for has already been explained, so you don't have to say it again. Now you can use this in a business context. Let's say you went over budget on a client's project and you might say to your team, how are we going to make it up to the client? How are we going to compensate for our wrongdoing? The wrongdoing is you went over budget. And then maybe someone would suggest we can make it up to them by offering a discount or offering a free product, offering an extra service. So those are how you're going to compensate for the wrongdoing, to make it up to someone. Number 10, to barge in. When you barge in, you enter a place, a location unexpectedly, and you interrupt whatever's taking place. For example, I was in my office working and this kid just barged in and handed me his CV, but later I hired him. So by saying the kid barged in, it implies that he didn't have an appointment, he wasn't expected, he just barged in unexpectedly and he interrupted whatever I was working on. But in this case, it was successful because he got the job. So now you have the first group, so let's complete your quiz. Here are the questions for the quiz. You need to complete each sentence using the correct phrasal verb. So go ahead and hit pause now and complete the quiz. Here are the correct answers. Go ahead and hit pause and see how well you did. So make sure you share your score in the comments and now let's continue with your second group of phrasal verbs. Number one, to abide by. This is more of a formal phrasal verb because it's used when you accept or follow a rule or regulation. So we use it mainly with government rules, court rules, even business rules as well. For example, as a tourist, you have to abide by the rules of the country you're visiting. So if you see a sign that says no parking, you have to abide by that rule. You have to follow that rule. Now remember, we also use this to say you simply accept. You accept, but then you follow it. For example, let's say you go to court because of a dispute and the court doesn't rule in your favor, you still have to abide by that decision. You have to accept it and then follow it. So this is a more formal phrasal verb, but it's very useful because we all have to abide by many different rules, regulations, and policies. Number two, to dawn on. This is an excellent phrasal verb to add to your daily vocabulary. To dawn on is when you finally realize or understand something. 
For example, one day it just dawned on me that I need to change careers. So one day I just realized I need to change career. So you can absolutely say realize, we're just using the phrasal verb dawn on and it's extremely common. Now, notice the sentence structure here. It dawned on me. Something dawns on someone. So the it is the realization. It dawned on me that I need to change careers. So just keep that in mind because the sentence structure is commonly used with it, dawns on, and then someone. Number three, to pull off. This is also a must know phrasal verb. When you pull something off, you're able to do something that is difficult or unlikely to do. For example, let's say you're a wedding planner and a couple comes to you and tells you they want to have this huge 300 person wedding in three weeks and they want you to plan everything. That's really difficult and it might even be unlikely that you're able to plan a 300 person wedding in three weeks. So you could say, I don't know if I can pull that off. I don't know if I can do that because it's very difficult. I don't know if I can pull that off. The that being planning the 300 person wedding. Now let's say you do successfully plan the wedding. After you could say, I can't believe I pulled that off. I can't believe I pulled off planning a 300 person wedding in only three weeks. Number four, to back out of. This is an excellent business phrasal verb. It's used when you fail to keep a commitment or a promise. Now in a business context, a commitment could be something you agreed to or arranged to. It can be formal and you have a contract in place or it could be more informal and you just agree to it verbally. So if you don't keep that commitment, then you back out of it. For example, I can't believe the client backed out at the last minute. Now notice here, I just said backed out. I didn't use the of. We only use the of when you specify the noun, the something. I can't believe the client backed out of the agreement, the project, the plan, the proposal at the last minute. Number five, to clam up. This is an excellent phrasal verb for all of you or anyone that does public speaking because when you clam up, you're unable to speak, usually because of fear or nervousness. But this can also be used if you simply refuse to speak for whatever reason. For example, I always clam up when I'm public speaking. When I'm public speaking, I become unable to get the words out. You clam up. Now my advice to you is if you feel like you're going to clam up, just take a deep breath. Number six, to mull over. When you mull something over, you think about it or you consider it. And the something you're mulling over is simply an idea, an idea, a proposal, a suggestion, and you mull it over, you think about it, you consider it. So let's say you're in a meeting and a client or colleague suggests a new tool to use and you need to think about it. So you could say, give me a few days to mull it over and I'll get back to you to mull it over, the it being using the tool, purchasing the tool, whatever you're going to do. Give me a few days to mull it over. Now you can also specify the noun and you can say, I need to mull the deal over before I commit. Number seven, to pan out. This is an extremely common phrasal verb. To pan out, simply talks about how a situation develops. For example, 
I'm not sure how this merger will pan out. So the situation here is the merger. And we're talking about, well, how's the merger going to go? How's it going to develop? Will it be positive? Will it be negative? Will there be challenges or difficulties, benefits? That's how the situation develops. So here I'm saying, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how the merger will pan out. Now let's say the merger has some difficulties or challenges. You could say the merger didn't pan out, didn't develop. The merger didn't pan out as we had expected. Number eight, to ramble on. This is an excellent one for all you public speakers because when you ramble on, you talk at length without getting to the point. So let's say I rambled on for five minutes trying to explain the definition of ramble on and at the end, you didn't understand it at all and you're confused, you're a little annoyed because I wasted your time, I rambled on. So this is used as a negative and it's used when you're communicating an idea. So we generally use this as a complaint. The speaker rambled on for 20 minutes. Number nine, to nod off. This is when you fall asleep, but it's when you fall asleep usually for a very short period of time and usually when you're not supposed to. So this isn't when you go to bed at the end of the night, okay? So let's say you're in a meeting at work and your colleague is rambling on and the topic is very boring and you start doing this. That is nodding off. And this motion of your head, what I'm doing, this is the verb to nod, nod your head. So when you fall asleep, what do you do? You nod your head. So that's where this phrasal verb to nod off comes from. And remember, we use this for short periods of time, usually when you're not supposed to fall asleep. For example, when you're driving. So I might say, I always listen to loud music when I'm driving at night, so I don't nod off. And number 10, I love this phrasal verb, to luck out. When you luck out, you're very lucky in a specific situation. So let's say there's this major sale on the new iPhone model and they're selling for 50% off and you go to the store and you get the very last one. You could say, I can't believe I lucked out and got the new iPhone for 50% off. You lucked out. You were very lucky in this specific situation. Or let's say you're driving during rush hour and you're going to an appointment and you get a parking spot right in front of the office in rush hour, downtown. You can say, I can't believe I lucked out and got such an amazing parking spot. Or if you're telling that story to a friend, I got this parking spot right in front of the building downtown during rush hour. They could say, wow, you really lucked out. You really lucked out by getting that parking spot. Are you ready for your next quiz? Here are the questions. Hit pause and complete the quiz now. Here are the answers. Hit pause and compare your answers to the correct answers. So how'd you do? Share your score and let's continue on with your next group of phrasal verbs. Number one, to rip off. We use this when someone is selling something or buying something and the buyer feels that the price is too high compared to the value of whatever they're buying. 
For example, I can't believe I paid $200 for that. She ripped me off. Now notice the sentence structure. You rip someone off. She ripped me off. Another example, she told everyone that I ripped her off, but it was a fair price. So just because someone claims you ripped them off, it doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Number two, to wear out. We use this when something is damaged or weakened because of age, it's old, or because of use, you've used it a lot. For example, I wore out my tennis shoes last summer. If someone said that to me, I would assume they played a lot of tennis last summer. They played so much tennis that they wore out their shoes. They became damaged from use, from continually playing tennis. We also use this in an adjective form to be worn out. So it would be very common to say, I need to buy new tennis shoes because mine are worn out. So of course are because shoes is plural and we need the plural form of the verb to be. Mine, my tennis shoes are worn out. So both forms are very common. Number three, to draw up. We use this when you need to prepare paperwork. And generally that paperwork is for a contract, an agreement, a proposal, generally something that two people need to sign or agree on to make it official. For example, I asked my lawyer to draw up the papers. Whenever you're dealing with a lawyer, the papers are going to be official. So this is a perfect time to use to draw up. Or you could say, we're waiting for our bank to draw up the mortgage agreement. So that's another very official document that you need to sign and you can use the phrasal verb to draw up. Number four, to burn out. This is a phrasal verb that has gotten a lot of attention recently, especially with the pandemic. Because to burn out, this is when you feel exhausted mentally or physically from prolonged stress. Stress of work, stress of a situation like a pandemic, stress of a family situation like a divorce or an illness, something like that, but a prolonged period. You can be stressed out for a day, but when you burn out, it means you've had that stress for a long period of time, several weeks, several months, or even several years. For for example, I burned out at my last job. So perhaps I was working so much that I went through this period of prolonged stress. I burned out. Another example, I burned out after caring for my aging parents. So caregivers often experience burnout. So you can use this in a work situation or you can use it in a personal situation as well. Number five, to look up to someone. So notice we have two prepositions, look up to and then someone. We use this when you admire someone or you respect someone. So I could say, I looked up to him like a father. So of course I admire and respect my father and I'm comparing the situation to someone else. I looked up to him, I admired him like a father. Another example, I really look up to my boss. So you admire your boss, or you respect your boss, you hold your boss in high regard. So you can use this in a work situation, you can look up to people, and you can use this in a social situation, a family situation. You can have many different people in your life that you look up to for different reasons. Number six, to step up. Now that's the phrasal verb, but we most commonly use it in the expression to step it up. Notice that it, it's very important to step it up, to step it up. This simply means to work harder or to try harder. Now you can say we need to step it up 
if we're going to meet the deadline. So you have this deadline, you need to work harder. So it's the same as saying we need to work harder if we're going to meet the deadline. Step it up. Now what is this it in the expression? Well the it would represent work or effort. We need to step up our work. We need to step up our effort. Step it up. I encourage you to use it that way. Step it up because you'll sound like a native speaker. We have a really common expression with this, step it up, and then you add the two words, a notch. Step it up a notch. If you look at a dial, a notch is one move on the dial. So it represents a little bit, a small amount. Step it up a notch. It's just like saying step it up a little bit. So that's just a common expression. You need to step it up a notch if you want to meet the deadline. So you can use it with a notch, it's very common, or you can use it without. Number seven, to hone in on. This is another two preposition phrasal verb. We have hone in on, hone in on something. And this means to really focus on something, to put all your attention on something specific. For example, if we want to get more customers, we should really hone in on small business owners. So maybe right now you're not being very specific and you're looking at all customers, but you want to hone in on one specific segment of the population, small business owners. So you're going to focus on them. You're going to hone in on them. Another example for the presentation, we should really hone in on South America. So maybe you're a global company and you have branches all over the world, but for this specific presentation, you're going to hone in on one specific part of the world, South America. Number eight, this is a must know phrasal verb to bring up. And this is when you begin a discussion on a specific topic. For example, if you're in a staff meeting, it would be very common for the boss or whoever's leading the meeting to say, before we end the meeting, does anyone have anything to bring up? Does anyone have a specific topic they want to discuss? Does anyone have anything to bring up? Or after the meeting, you might tell another colleague, I didn't have a chance to bring up the marketing proposal. So you didn't have a chance to discuss this specific topic, the marketing proposal. Maybe you ran out of time. Number nine, to talk into. And the sentence structure is to talk someone into something. And this means to convince someone to do something. For example, she talked me into helping her move. She convinced me to help her move. So when someone uses this, oh, she talked me into helping her move, it gives you the impression that the person didn't really want to do the activity, but somebody convinced them. But please, I really need your help, I'll buy pizza. Or maybe you could say, my team talked me into bringing up the bonus at the staff meeting. So notice I use bring up, discuss a specific topic, the bonus. My team talked me into bringing up the bonus. Now, because maybe discussing the bonus is a little bit of a sensitive issue and nobody wants to do it, but your team convinced you, lucky you, <laughs> so they talked you into it. And number 10, to stick around. This is a must use phrasal verb. You can use it in a social setting or a professional setting. To stick around means to stay in a location for a period of time. So let's say you're at this beautiful park with a friend and after an hour or so, your friend has to leave and they say, do you wanna share an Uber? And you say, no, I'm gonna stick around a little bit longer. So you're going to stay in 
a specific location, the park, for a period of time. It's unknown how long you'll stay. That doesn't really matter. It's just the fact you're going to stay. I'm gonna stick around a little bit longer. It's such a beautiful day. I'm gonna stick around. Now you can also use this in the negative. I can't stick around very long because I have a meeting. Although it's a beautiful day, I can't stick around very long. I have a meeting to get back to. Are you ready for your next quiz? Here are the questions. Hit pause now, complete the quiz, and whenever you're ready, hit play, and I'll share the answers. So go ahead and hit pause now. Here are the answers. So hit pause, review the answers, and whenever you're ready, hit play and come back to the video. So of course, share your score and let's continue on. Number one, to take up. This means to occupy or to fill. Now, we use this specifically with two different nouns. You can take up time and you can take up space. And they're both very commonly used. For example, I could say, this meeting took up my whole morning. So it occupied or filled the amount of time. Now, we can also use this with space. For example, I need a new couch because my couch takes up too much space. So it occupies or fills space. So remember, you can use this with both time and space, and they're both very commonly used. Number two, to branch out. Now this means to expand. And we use this specifically in a business context. So let's say you're in a meeting and you're discussing how to increase your profits. You might suggest branching out into new markets. So if you only sell in North America, you can branch out, expand, and sell in Europe or in Asia, Africa, for example. We need to branch out into new markets. Number three, this is a fun one, to jot down. Now you would probably understand this from context. In the meeting, I jotted down a few notes. I jotted down a few notes. So it's the exact same thing as write down. I wrote down a few notes, but it's very commonly used. So someone might ask you, maybe your boss or a colleague even, might say, hey, can you jot this down? And then they might give you a number or a date or a location and you write it down. Now, of course, not many people use pen and paper anymore, right? We take electronic notes. But if your colleague asks you to jot something down, you can absolutely take out your phone and make a note in your phone. Jot it down in your phone. Write it down in your phone. So this still applies even though we don't really use pen and paper much. Number four, to carry out. This means to perform or to conduct, and we use this specifically in a business context. For example, next week we're carrying out our customer surveys, our student surveys. We're carrying out our surveys. We're conducting them. We're performing them. So I'm just going to do the survey. That's the simplest way to say it. Next week we're doing the surveys. We're carrying out the surveys. Number five, this is an important one, so make sure you jot it down. Number five, to keep up with something. This means to make sufficient progress on. Let's say that you have this many orders and it's your job to fulfill those orders. If you fulfill this many, you've kept up with the orders. You've made sufficient progress. But if you fulfill this many, or this many, or this many, or anything less than the total number of orders, then you haven't 
kept up with the orders. You haven't made sufficient progress on. Now, of course, you can use this with many things other than orders. You can use it with your studies, your reading list, your chores, your performance reports, your filing, your scheduling. You can use it with many, many, many other tasks. Number six, to fill out or to fill in a form. Now, this is one that confuses a lot of students and they ask me, do I fill out a form? Do I fill in the form? What's the difference? The reality is there is no difference specifically when we're talking about a form. Now, when you have to fill out an application, you could also fill in an application. Fill out your passport renewal. You can fill in your passport renewal. In this specific context, there's no difference. Number seven, to drop in. This is a great phrasal verb because you can use it both in a business context or a social context. Now, to drop in simply means to visit. So, if you're talking to a friend, and you're planning to visit that friend, you can say, how about I drop in Saturday morning? How about I visit Saturday morning? Now, in a business context, you might have a client that wants to drop in, that wants to visit, or you might drop in on a client just to say hello and to keep that relationship going. So you can use this in both a social and a business context. Number eight, to push back. This means to delay or postpone in the context of a scheduled event. So a scheduled event like a meeting. Let's say the meeting was scheduled for Monday, but everyone is really busy on Monday. Well then push the meeting back until Wednesday. Postpone it until Wednesday. Now you can use this in a social context. So you might be planning your wedding anniversary and it's your 10 year wedding anniversary. And the actual date is March 30th, but everyone is busy. So you might push it back until the middle of April so more people can attend. Well, everyone's busy, so let's push back the party until next week, until two weeks from now. So you can push back a scheduled event, which means to delay or postpone. Number nine, to call off. Now, this means to cancel a scheduled event. So remember in our last one, to push back, you delay or postpone. But the other alternative is simply to cancel it. But generally, when you call something off, it's because there were some problems or issues associated with it. But the problem or issue could be a scheduling conflict and just people couldn't attend. So let's say you were planning a conference for the summer, but nobody registered because everyone's really busy in the summer. So you might discuss it with your team and say, let's call off the conference. Attendance is too low, so let's call it off. Let's cancel it. Now you can also use this in a social context. You might call off your wedding, but if you canceled your wedding, then most likely there was a problem, an issue, a big one, right? So in that context, in a social event, most people will wonder what happened. Why did they call off their wedding? Why did they call off their anniversary? They're going to assume that something is wrong. And number 10, to sort out. This means to organize or to fix if there's a problem. For example, I need to sort out my travel plans. So it could mean I just need to organize them. So I need to decide when I'm going to travel, what airline I'm going to use, what hotel I'm going to use. 
I need to sort out my travel plans. But I can also use it if there's some sort of problem and I need to fix it. For example, my flight was canceled, so I need to sort out my travel plans. I need to fix this problem with my plans. So to sort something out, you can organize it or you can fix it if there's a problem. Are you ready for your next quiz? So here are the questions, hit pause and complete the quiz now. So here are the answers. So now let's review your final group of phrasal verbs. Number one, to tune out. This is a very useful phrasal verb because it's used to say you stop listening to someone, you stop paying attention to them because you don't like what they're saying basically. So you tune someone out. This is something that kids do all the time with their parents, right? If your parent is giving you advice and you don't wanna hear it, you just tune them out. So your parent is talking, but you're just not really listening. So you might say, I always tune out my mom when she gives me relationship advice. Now this can also happen a lot in a workplace situation. Let's say the coworker that sits beside you is just a very negative person and complains a lot. You might just simply tune them out. So you stop listening to them because you don't want to hear all that negativity and complaining. So you just tune them out. They're talking, but you're not listening. Number two, to tick off. This is a useful one because it means to annoy, to anger, or to irritate. Now we use this in two very specific sentence structures. It ticks someone off. It ticks me off when my coworker doesn't help. So it ticks someone off and then you explain the situation that causes the anger, the frustration, or the irritation. Now the other sentence structure is just to say someone or something ticks me off. John really ticks me off. He's so negative. John really irritates me, frustrates me, annoys me. John really ticks me off, he's so negative, but I just tune him out. Number three, to talk up. And you talk someone or something up. And that means you speak in a way that makes that someone or something sound really beneficial, really positive, really amazing, maybe even more so than the reality. So let's say you're in sales and you're trying to sell this piece of software to a company, well, you're going to talk up that software. You're going to talk about that software in a way that really highlights all of its positive features. And you probably won't mention any negative features. You're going to talk it up. Or let's say that your really close friend applied for a job in your company. Well, you're probably going to talk up your friend. You're going to speak about your friend very enthusiastically, very positively, because you want your friend to get the job. You're going to talk up your friend. Number four, to pile up. This means simply to increase in amount. And we generally use this with work. So in general, you could say work is really piling up. Work is increasing in amount. You can use this with specific work. So you might say my expense reports are piling up. Or even with household chores, you might say the laundry is piling up. The dirty dishes are piling up. They're increasing in amount. Number five, to mope around. To mope around, this is when someone moves from one location to another, but they do it in a very unhappy way, a lazy way, a disappointed way, and it's generally because something is wrong, something specific is wrong. So maybe they just lost their job, or they just 
broke up with their girlfriend, so they mope around the house all day. They go from the couch to the kitchen, back to the couch, but they look really upset and lazy and no energy. So this isn't really a positive thing. We generally say stop moping around. You need to stop moping around and start looking for a job if that's the reason why you're moping around because you lost your job. Stop moping around and look for a job. Number six, to loosen up. This is a great one. It means to be more relaxed, more comfortable, or less serious. So you might say she was very shy at first, but then she loosened up. So she became more relaxed, more comfortable. Now we often use this as advice to someone. If someone is just being too serious, you might say, loosen up, loosen up. It's similar to saying, relax a little, relax a little, loosen up. You need to loosen up. Oh, just loosen up. Number seven, to kick off. This is a great one because when you kick something off, it means you start. But we use this in the context of a sports event, a meeting, a conference, or even a party. So some sort of event with people. So in sports, it's very common to say the game, the match kicks off at and then you say the time. The match kicks off at three. The game kicks off at seven. And that's just when the game starts. Now you could also say, let's kick off the meeting by, and then you can explain how you're going to start the meeting. Let's kick off the meeting by introducing the new CFO. Or let's kick off the meeting by sharing the good news. Number eight, this is a fun one, to horse around. When you horse around, you behave in a silly or noisy way. So basically what children do all the time, they horse around. But you might say, the kids were horsing around and they broke my favorite vase. Now, although this is commonly used in children, it can of course be used for adults as well because adults act in silly and noisy ways all the time, right? Even in workplace contexts. So you might be talking about how your team is constantly horsing around. And as a bonus, you can also say goof around. It's an alternative, but they're both very commonly used. So horse around or goof around. Number nine, to get by. This is when you have just enough money to live on, but not very much extra. So you can basically pay all your bills and that's about it. So you might say, since our twins were born, it's been more difficult to get by. You have two new babies in the house. Well, first, congratulations, but of course that's very expensive. So now you only have enough money to pay your bills, to buy the food, buy the diapers, buy the groceries, pay your mortgage, things like that. We're getting by, we're getting by. You're just surviving. So if someone knows you're going through a tough time financially, maybe you lost your job and they ask you, how's it going? Is everything okay? You could say, well, I'm getting by, I'm getting by, which lets them know you're surviving. You have enough to pay all your core expenses. And finally, number 10 to flip out. Now this can mean to become very excited, but it can also mean to become very angry or agitated. So it's when you have a very strong emotion, but that emotion can be positive excitement or it can be negative anger. And it will be obvious based on context. So if you just won a competition or a prize or the lottery, you might flip out and become very, very excited, right? The sports team flipped out when they won 
the gold medal. Or the team flipped out when they lost the game. The team became very angry. So you can use it in both situations. And for this expression, you can also say freak out. Freak out, flip out, they mean the same. And again, positive excitement or negative anger. Are you ready for your final quiz? So here are the questions. Of course, hit pause, take as much time as you need, and when you're ready, hit play and I'll share the answers. So you can go ahead and hit pause now. Here are the answers. Go ahead and hit pause and figure out how you did. Amazing job with those phrasal verbs. But like I said, native speakers, we love using phrasal verbs and there's a lot more than 50 in our vocabulary. So let's keep going and let's keep learning 50 more phrasal verbs. So we'll do the same thing. You'll learn a group of phrasal verbs and you'll complete a quiz and you'll move on. So let's get started with the first group. Number one, to ache for, to ache for. This is a very nice romantic phrasal verb. Now we really use this in the context of a romantic relationship. So make sure you use that appropriately. And to ache for something or someone is when you really, really want that something or someone. For example, he was lonely and aching for love. So this is perhaps a little more of a poetic phrasal verb. You will probably hear it in novels, stories, movies, TV. He was aching for love. So maybe you won't use that in your vocabulary, but you'll likely hear it in romance movies or romance novels. Now you may be more likely to use ache for someone. Let's say your husband is overseas on a business trip and he'll be gone for two or three weeks. You might say, I'm aching for my husband. So if you're talking to your friends or family, even your colleagues, you could say, oh, I'm really aching for my husband. He's been gone for two weeks already. Number two, to beef up. This is a fun one. When you beef something up, you make it stronger or more important. Now we do use this in the context of bodybuilders and they can beef themselves up, become more muscular. So you can use that in a fitness context, but we also use this in more of a business context, perhaps surprisingly, because you might say, I need to beef up my resume. I need to make my resume stronger or more important. I need to beef up my communication skills, for example. Number three, to make up. And in this context, we're talking about to make up with someone, with someone. To make up with someone is when you forgive someone after an argument or a dispute. In a family context, young kids argue a lot, right? And older kids too. But you might say to your son, your daughter, you need to make up with your sister, you need to make up with your brother, you need to make up with your cousin or a friend, and you list a specific person, which means you need to forgive that person, stop being angry at that person, stop fighting with that person. So we definitely use this in a social context, a family context, but you can absolutely use this in a professional context. Coworkers fight as well. There are disagreements in companies. So you might say to one coworker, Sally, you need to make up with Mark. You work on the same team. You have to get along. You need to make up with each other. Number four, to nail down. This is when you understand the exact details of something or you get a firm decision on something. So let's say you're planning a conference and you have a general idea of the conference. It will take place 
in summer. It will be on this general topic or theme. But when are the exact dates? What specific topics? Who specifically will be the keynote speaker? Who specifically will be presenting? Who will you hire to cater the conference? You need to nail down those details. So you need to either understand the exact details or you need to make a firm decision on who's going to cater when the conference will exactly take place. So that's a very useful phrasal verb and you can use it in a business context or a social context. Number five, to open up. When you open up to someone, you talk very freely about your feelings or your emotions, things that make you quite vulnerable, things you probably don't share with everybody. For example, after years, she finally opened up about his death. So for many years, there was this tragic death perhaps, and she didn't really talk about it. She didn't talk about her feelings about the death, but then after years, she opened up. She started talking freely about how she felt, the circumstances, how she's dealing with it, those types of things, her inner feelings and emotions. Now notice I didn't use to someone. I could say she opened up to her family about his death. So you have about and then the specific topic and to and the specific people. You'll commonly hear people say, I've never opened up to anybody like this before. If someone says that to you, they're basically saying they feel very comfortable around you. They feel like they can share their inner thoughts, feelings, emotions. And that's a very positive thing. It shows you have a very close relationship. Number six, to slip into something. Now this is when you quickly put on a piece of clothing. So this is a very specific phrasal verb. It's only used with clothing. Now, for example, this shirt is quite pretty, isn't it? But let's be honest, it's not the most comfortable shirt. So after I'm done recording this video, I'm going to slip into a t-shirt. I'm going to put on a t-shirt. Or if it's first thing in the morning and you're in your house coat, but then you hear your doorbell, you might quickly slip into some sweatpants and answer the door. So it's simply another way to say put on. Number seven, to stand by something. When you stand by something, it's used to show that you still support or believe something. So I might say we stand by our opinion that interest rates need to increase. So that's my opinion, that's my belief. Interest rates need to increase. I stand by that. I still support that, I still believe that. So you'll hear this a lot from people in power, politicians, executives in business. They'll have an opinion, have a belief, and then they'll state, I stand by that. To let you know they still believe that specific opinion. Do you stand by that and if so, why? Uh, I stand by that. Uh, yes, I stand by that. And the reason simply is now we also use this with stand by someone. When you stand by someone, it means that you support someone, usually when something negative has happened. So let's say that your coworker was accused of stealing from the company, but you know your coworker didn't do it. You might say, I stand by her, I stand by her, which means you're going to support her in this difficult time. Number eight, to wind down, to wind down. This is an excellent phrasal verb because it means to relax after a busy or stressful day. So you might say, I always read at the end of the day to wind down. To help me wind down, I always read at the end of the day, or I go for a walk after work to wind down. So it just means to relax, but it's another way of saying it, and it implies that you were very busy or stressed out, to wind down. 
Number nine, to zone out. This is when you stop paying attention for a short period of time. Now we've all done this, especially when we were kids in school and your teacher's talking and you just zone out. Now generally people zone out because they don't have interest in a particular topic. For example, whenever people talk about sports, I zone out. I just stop listening and I start thinking about something else in my own head and I'm not listening to the conversation about sports. I zone out, I stop paying attention. But then when the conversation changes, I'll pay attention again. So it's always for that short period of time. Number 10, to turn in. This is a very useful phrasal verb because it simply means to go to bed. It's another way of saying to go to bed and it's very common. So of course you can say, I'm tired, I'm going to bed. But you can also say, I'm tired, I'm going to turn in. I'm going to turn in. And it's extremely commonly used, so I suggest you use it. You can use it as a suggestion, hey, it's getting late and you have that job interview tomorrow. You should turn in. You should go to bed. Or you can use it in question form as well. What time did you turn in? What time did you go to bed? Are you ready for your first quiz? So here are the questions. Of course, hit pause, take as much time as you need, and when you're ready, hit play, and I'll share the answers. So you can go ahead and hit pause now. Here are the answers. Go ahead and hit pause and figure out how you did. How did you do on the quiz? Make sure you share your score in the comments below and let's continue on with the next group of phrasal verbs. Phrasal verb number one, to act on. This simply means to take action, so to act, but you act on specific information, advice, or recommendations that you've received. For example, the manager acted on the findings of the report. So of course, in this report, there's lots of information and advice, and if you act on that information, the manager acted on the findings of the report. Or in a meeting, you might suggest to your coworkers, we need to act on the recommendations. We need to take action. Outside of the workplace, you might say, we need to act on the advice from our financial analyst. So they gave you some advice, you need to act on it. Number two, to bargain for. To bargain for, this is when you expect something to happen, but that something is usually negative. So you expect something negative to happen. Now, notice the sentence structure here because we most commonly use this phrasal verb in the negative form. We hadn't bargained for such a high interest rate. So it's saying we didn't expect. Or you could say we hadn't bargained for so many people at the conference. So this is a great expression that you can use, but I recommend using it in the negative. Number three, to opt in. When you opt into something, it means you become a member of something. So if you're a new employee at the company, they might have certain things that are membership based, such as the pension plan, the healthcare plan, or other insurance plans, maybe even some committees. And if you want to be a member, you need to opt in. For example, as a new employee, you need to opt into the insurance plan. Now the opposite of in is out. So if you don't wanna be a member, you can opt out. So for example, new employees are automatically added to the insurance policy. If you don't wanna be a member, you need to opt out you need to opt out. Number four, to play down. This is a great phrasal verb. It means to make something seem less important or less serious 
than it really is. For example, the government tried to play down the scandal. So they had the scandal and they want to make it seem less important or less serious. They tried to play it down. Or I could say the documentary played down his divorce. So there's this documentary on this person who got divorced and they're trying to make it seem less serious or less important than it really was in reality. And that's what you need to keep in mind. In reality, the situation was more serious, but the documentary played it down. Oh, it wasn't that big of a deal. Number five, to drop out. When you drop out, this is specifically used when you quit a course or you quit an entire program, a school program. So if you're pursuing a degree and you quit, then you drop out. Now, interestingly, Bill Gates dropped out of college to start Microsoft, and we know how successful that was. So although it might seem negative that you drop out, you quit, Maybe not always the case. Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, also dropped out of college to start Facebook. I'm not encouraging you to drop out, but it's not always a negative. And you can also use this for a specific course. For example, I think I'm going to drop out of calculus. It's too difficult. I'm going to quit calculus. Number six, to cut back. This is when you spend less, you do less, or you use less of something. This is very commonly used by governments or companies. The government has announced plans to cut back on defense spending by 10%. Now notice I said on. If you specify the something, defense spending, you need to use the preposition on, cut back on. Cut back on defense spending. I could also just say the government announced plans to cut back. In that sense, it's just reduce, reduce spending, spend less, and then you have to clarify, well, cut back on what? Now we frequently use this as advice to someone. Let's say you told me, Jennifer, I drink 10 sodas a day. I would say, whoa, you should cut back. You should consume less. That's too much soda. You should cut back. Number seven, to sit in on. This is a great business phrasal verb. It's used specifically in the context of a meeting. And when you sit in on a meeting, it means you attend a meeting, but you only attend that meeting as an observer. So you're not going to participate, you're not going to present, you're not going to ask questions, you're just going to attend as an observer. So if there's a really interesting meeting at work, but you're not directly related to the subject matter, you might ask the organizer, is it okay if I sit in on the meeting today? And which means you're just going to attend to listen, to receive the information. You're not going to participate. Or if you're planning a sales meeting, you might say, it would be useful to have someone from accounting sit in on the meeting. So someone from accounting is just going to be there to absorb the information, but you don't expect them to participate or present anything. So very useful phrasal verb in a business context. Number eight, this is a fun one, to whip up, to whip up. This is very specific because it's used with food and is used when you make food quickly. So you make yourself breakfast, lunch, dinner, a snack, it doesn't matter, you make any type of food, but you do it really quickly. So you might say, oh no, I'm running late, I need to whip up my breakfast. I need to make my breakfast really quickly. Or let's say you have some guests come over unexpectedly and you want to serve them something. You might say to your husband, give me a few minutes to whip up some appetizers. I'm going to make some appetizers really quickly. So it's a great phrasal verb that you can add to your daily vocabulary. 
Number nine, to dress up. I love this phrasal verb. To dress up is when you wear more professional or formal clothing, usually for a specific occasion. So if you're going out for a nice dinner, maybe it's someone's birthday or an anniversary, you would dress up. You would wear more formal or professional clothing than you normally would. Or let's say you have some really important guests coming into your office, some VIP guests. Well, you might dress up. If you normally wear just a t-shirt, well, you might put on a dress shirt, maybe even a suit with a tie. Or if you're going to a wedding, of course, that's a great opportunity to dress up, to wear more formal clothing. Now, we often use this in question form. If you're invited to a dinner or a party, you might ask, do I need to dress up? Do I need to wear more formal clothing? And they can reply back and say, no, it's informal. There's no need to dress up. And number 10, to get at, to get at something. When someone is getting at something, they're trying to explain or express something specific. We commonly use this in question form. Let's say your coworker is talking to you and they're talking about a meeting that you have, but you're not really sure what they're trying to express to you, what they're trying to explain. You could say, I'm not sure what you're getting at. I'm not sure what you mean. I'm not sure what you're trying to explain. I'm not sure what you're getting at. Now we also use this when we're trying to explain something and the explanation isn't going too well. And then we can say, what I'm trying to get at is we need to cut back. <laughs> what I'm trying to get at is, and then you state what you mean, what you're trying to explain. Are you ready for your second quiz? Here are the questions. Hit pause, take as much time as you need, and when you're ready, you can hit play and see the answers. Here are the answers. Hit pause and you can compare your answers to see how well you did. Awesome job with that quiz. Share your score and let's keep going. Number one, to bear on. This means to be connected to or related to. For example, I don't see how that information bears on this case. So I don't see how that information is connected to or related to this case. I don't see how it bears on this case. Now we can also mean to bear on to mean influence or effect. For example, our relationship didn't bear on my decision. So maybe you have a personal relationship with a contractor and you interviewed many contractors and you chose the one you have a personal relationship with, but you want people to know that personal relationship didn't impact or affect. It didn't bear on my decision. This is a more professional or formal phrasal verb. You'll hear it a lot in the news, in reports, and you can use it a lot in a business context. Number two, to care for something. When you care for something, not someone, something, it means that you like, you have a preference for that something but we commonly use this in the negative. So I could say, I don't care for chocolate cake. I don't care for chocolate cake. It's just another way of saying, I don't like chocolate cake. I don't have a preference for chocolate cake. I don't care for chocolate cake. So it's a, another way if somebody offers you something, you could decline it and simply say, oh, I don't care for chocolate cake. Or if your coworkers are discussing the latest reality TV show and they want to know what you think about it, you could say, I don't care for reality TV. It's just letting them know you don't really like it. It's not your personal preference. 
Number three, to perk up. To perk up means to feel better, happier, or more energized. So think of first thing in the morning, when you wake up, you're still pretty sleepy, right? And what do a lot of people do? They drink coffee. So you could say coffee perks me up. Coffee makes me more energized or going for a walk perks me up. We also use this when someone isn't feeling well because they're sick or because something negative happened, like they lost their job, and you might go over with some flowers, with some chocolates, or just with yourself to try to help perk up that other person, to help make them feel better, happier, more energized. So you might say, well, the flowers perked her up, perked her up. The flowers perked her up. The flowers made her feel better, happier, more energized. Number four, to sift through. This is a great phrasal verb. We use this when you have large amounts of information, perhaps a lot of paperwork or files, books, and you need to examine that information to determine what's useful, what's important. For example, after Giuliano quit, I had to sift through all his files. So he has all these files, a lot of information, and you have to examine all of them to determine what you can delete and what's important and you need to keep. Or at home, maybe you're going through your grandmother's photo albums and she has 20, 30 different photo albums. So you might ask your brother, can you help me sift through these photo albums? So you're going to examine them to determine what pictures you want to keep and what pictures you want to get rid of. Maybe you don't know who's in that photo or the quality is really bad. Number five, to wrap up. This is another way of saying to end, to finish, but is very commonly used, especially in a business context. So if you're in a meeting and you're coming to the end of the meeting, you could simply say, all right, everyone, let's wrap up. Let's wrap up for today. Now we commonly add it, Let's wrap it up. Let's wrap it up for today. It's getting late, let's wrap it up. The it is the meeting. The meeting, the conference, the event, whatever you're in that you want to finish or end. Or you could say, how should we wrap up the conference? How should we finish or end the conference? You want to do it in a memorable way, right? How should we wrap up the conference? And then you can have a discussion on that. Number six, to flip through. When you flip through a book, a report, a magazine, it means you go through it really quickly. So usually because you want to get a general idea of what that book is about, or because you're looking for very specific information. So if you have this report that's 130 pages, but you're looking for a very specific piece of information, you can just quickly flip through it to find that specific part of the report. Or you can do this when you're waiting for a friend to arrive, waiting for a bus. You might flip through a magazine. Just look through it, but you're not really reading anything. You're just flipping through it. You're going through it quickly. Number seven, to draw out. When you draw something out, you make it a lot longer than necessary or needed. So it's usually used in a more negative context. For example, he really drew out his speech. He made the speech a lot longer than it needed to be or that it should have been. So it's more of a negative, it's criticizing the speech. Or you could say, they really drew out the ending of the movie. So maybe you were enjoying the movie, but then the end was just really long, way longer than it needed to be. And you're wondering, when is this movie going to end? They really drew out the end of the movie. 
Number eight, to fall behind. This is a great phrasal verb for both a professional context and a personal context. When you fall behind, it means you make less progress than wanted or needed. Let's say you were off sick from work for over a week. Well, you're definitely going to fall behind. You're going to make less progress than needed because you have a deadline or than just you simply wanted to make because you were gone for an entire week. So often we can fall behind because we're sick or there's a competing deadline or competing project or something going on in your personal life, but it could also simply be because we didn't work hard enough or or fast enough and we fell behind. So in a school context, if you don't spend enough time reading or doing your homework, your exercises, you might fall behind. And if you fall behind, you might have to ask your professor for an extension on a specific assignment. Number nine, to get around. This is when you move from place to place within a specific location. So let's say the location is your city and I'm visiting your city. I could ask you, what's the best way to get around? What's the best method of transportation to go from place to place within your city? So what would you say? What's the best way to get around in your city? And then you can say, oh, Jennifer, you can easily get around on foot, which means you can walk from location to location because your city is very small. Or you might say you definitely need a car to get around. Maybe your city is quite large and spaced out and it's not possible to walk. So you need a car to get around, to go from place to place. So this is an extremely useful phrasal verb when you're a tourist, because you should absolutely know how to get around in the city you're visiting. And finally, number 10, to put off. When you put something off, it means you delay it or postpone it. Now you could put off a meeting, you could delay or postpone a meeting for a specific reason. You might say, let's put off the meeting until next week. So let's delay the meeting until next week. A lot of times people will put off things that are unpleasant, things they don't want to do. For example, I've been putting off asking my boss for a raise. I've been putting off asking my boss for a raise. So notice the gerund verb. I've been putting off asking. I've been putting off cleaning my closet. I've been putting off buying new tires. So you need that gerund verb. And why are you delaying it postponing? Because it's uncomfortable, unpleasant. Are you ready for your third quiz? Here are the questions. Hit pause, take as much time as you need, and when you're ready, you can hit play and see the answers. Here are the answers. Hit pause and you can compare your answers to see how well you did. You're doing so awesome. Let's keep going, share your score, and let's get going. Number one, to aim at and you aim at a target. And when you aim at a target, this means to intend to achieve that target. So you just try, <laughs> you try to achieve that target. For example, they're aiming at reducing their costs by 10%. So what's the target in this sentence? Reducing their cost by 10%. That entire clause is the target. Now notice we have a gerund verb. So you can absolutely have a gerund verb. You can aim at doing something, so a gerund verb. You can also use a noun. For example, his slingshot was aimed at his neighbor's garage. So the target in this example is 
the neighbor's garage. And his slingshot was aimed at because that's the target he's attempting to achieve. Number two, this is a great one, to shrug off. When you shrug something off, you disregard it. You don't consider it important. So I could say his insult, an insult is something negative you say to another person. His insult was aimed at me, to use our first phrasal verb. His insult was aimed at me, but I shrugged it off. I said, meh. I don't care. I'm not going to let it bother me. I'm not going to let it hurt me. It's not important. I'm going to disregard it. I'm going to shrug it off. Now notice what I'm doing with my shoulders because this is the verb shrug. You can shrug your shoulders and we generally do that when we want to say meh whatever, we tend to shrug our shoulders. So that's where this expression comes from. Number three, to egg on. That's right, to egg on. This is a fun one. When you egg someone on, you encourage them to do something, but that something isn't in their best interest. For example, let's say a student is arguing with their teacher. Now that probably isn't in the student's best interest to argue with the teacher. But if the other students are saying, yeah, keep going, you're doing great, they're egging him on. They're egging that student on. They're encouraging that student to keep arguing even though arguing isn't in his best interest. Or let's say you're considering doing something a little risky, like jumping off a high cliff when you don't know what's beneath you. And maybe you're not really serious about it, but the crowd eggs you on. Oh, do it, you can do it, you should do it. They're encouraging you, even though it can have a really negative outcome. The crowd egged them on to jump off the cliff. Now, most likely you won't use this in your everyday vocabulary, but you'll commonly hear this on TV, in movies, or when you're reading. So I wanted to share it with you so you're not confused when you see this egg on and you have no idea what they're talking about. Now you do. Number four, to turn down. When you turn something down, it means you reject that something. And we use this in the context of an offer or an invitation. For example, they offered her the job, but she turned it down. She said no to the job. So of course you can say she rejected, but it's very common, more common to say she turned it down. So you can turn down something like a job offer. You can also turn down an invitation from someone else, a social invitation or a romantic invitation. For example, I asked Marissa out, but she turned me down. When you ask someone out, it means you invite them to dinner or a coffee for romantic purposes. I asked Marissa out, but she turned me down. She rejected my offer. Number five, to zoom in or the opposite, to zoom out. If there are any photographers here, you already know what this means because when you zoom in, the object becomes closer. And when you zoom out, the object becomes farther away. And I'm sharing this with you because everyone is meeting on video conference now. When you're having a video conference, you have a camera that's focusing on you. And it's really important you have the correct zoom. You don't want to be too close. If you're too close to the camera, you need to zoom out. If you're too far, you need to zoom in. So you might ask a colleague, hey, I can't see you very well. Can you zoom in? Or a colleague might tell you, your picture's all blurry. You need to zoom out. So now you know what that means for your next video call. Number six, to wiggle out of. This is 
a great one. When you wiggle out of something, you avoid a situation, a task, a chore, a responsibility that you don't really want to do, and you avoid it in a cunning way. So let's say that tomorrow you're supposed to clean out the garage and you don't really want to, but your wife or your husband, your sister, your brother, whoever wants you to clean out the garage. Now tomorrow, when you're supposed to clean out that garage, maybe you get an urgent phone call just at the right moment and you have to go to work and finish something but you planned that phone call. You planned that phone call to take place right as you needed to clean the garage. So you did that in a cunning way. So you try to wiggle out of cleaning the garage. So basically when you're asked to do something and then you try to avoid it by creating a scenario where you have another responsibility or maybe a friend asks you to move but you tell them, oh, you have a back injury so you hurt your back and now you can't help them move so you try to wiggle out of it number seven to hold up this is a must know phrasal verb because we use it when you're delayed and you're delayed specifically while you're traveling. This could be traveling on a flight or a train, so a more long distance travel, but it can also just be traveling from your office to another boardroom or from your house to the car. So it can be a very short distance travel or a more longer travel as well. For example, my kids always hold me up when I'm trying to leave. So you're trying to leave the house and then your kids, mom, mom, I need this, help me find that, do this for me, and they delay you. They delay you when you're trying to leave, you're trying to travel. My kids always hold me up. Now, we commonly use this in the passive form. So you might have an appointment that you're trying to get to and you're late, and when you get to that appointment, you can say, sorry I'm late, I was held up. To be held up. I was held up by my kids. Oh, I was held up. Number eight, to hit it off. This is a great one. When you hit it off, it means you have a very positive relationship with someone right from the first time you meet them. So let's say you have a new coworker and the first conversation you have, you realize you have a lot in common, you really like the person, they're nice, they're funny, they like you, the conversation's going really well, you can say, wow, we really hit it off, hit it off. That it is just our relationship. We hit our relationship off, but we always use it. We really hit it off. Now notice how I also said we. We almost always use this expression with the subject we. My coworker and I, or we. My coworker and I hit it off. I would not say I hit it off with my coworker. That sounds unnatural. We say we hit it off. Number nine, to get through. When you get through something, it simply means you finish it. But that something is usually a chore or an unpleasant task, something that isn't enjoyable. For example, I have 10 reports I need to get through by the end of the day. I have 10 reports I need to finish by the end of the day. But when I use the phrasal verb get through, it implies there's going to be some effort, some struggle. I don't really enjoy the task. Number 10, to freshen up. When you freshen up, you quickly improve your appearance. So before you go into a meeting or to a social event, you can 
freshen up. You can go into the bathroom and you can brush your hair, you can put on fresh lipstick, you can check your makeup. Now, if you're a guy, maybe you put on deodorant or cologne, things like that. So you quickly improve your appearance. You freshen up. So let's say you're going out for a nice dinner. You might say, oh, just give me five minutes to freshen up. Are you ready for your fourth quiz? Here are the questions. Hit pause, take as much time as you need, and when you're ready, hit play to see the answers. Here are your answers. So hit pause, take as much time as you need to review the answers. This is your last group of phrasal verbs. Let's get started. To take off. This is used when a flight leaves the ground. For example, tomorrow my flight takes off at 7 a.m. Or what time did your flight take off? So this is another way of simply saying, what time did your flight leave? Now we also use this phrasal verb to talk about a person leaving a location. So you might be at a party and it's getting late, you have an early meeting and you say, thanks for the party, I'm going to take off, I'm going to leave. Or someone might ask you, what time did you take off last night? What time did you leave? Now, take off is also used to remove an item of clothing. So at night, before you get into your pajamas, you take off your clothes, right? Before you get into the shower, you take off your clothes. I can also take off my makeup, which means to remove. Or if it's really hot in the room, you might say, oh, it's so hot in here. I need to take off my sweater. Or when you come into the house and it's cold out, you take off your jacket, you take off your shoes, you take off your hat, you take off your gloves, take off your sunglasses. So you can take off an item of clothing, but you can also take off accessories like rings, makeup, glasses as well. Take off can also mean to become successful. For example, after I improved my English speaking skills, my career really took off. My career became successful. My career took off. Or I could say overnight, my YouTube channel took off. My YouTube channel became successful. So many different phrasal verbs would take off, but they're all commonly used. So make sure you learn all these individual meanings. To take after someone. When you take after someone, you resemble them in either personality or appearance. And this is most commonly used with family members. For example, it's very common for a son to take after his dad which means he looks like him. They look very similar. But you might also say, Julie is so funny. She really takes after Uncle Frank. So maybe Uncle Frank is really funny. He's always telling these hilarious jokes. And then Julie is also really funny. She takes after Uncle Frank. So you can use this with personality or appearance to take apart. When you take something apart, you disassemble it. So it goes from being whole, one complete item, and then you disassemble it into individual parts. So if your car isn't working, you might take apart the motor or take apart the engine to try to figure out what the problem is. You might also take apart a desk or take apart a bed when you're getting rid of it, when you're removing it from your home because it's easier to move when it's in individual parts rather than one big structure. To take back. When you take something back, it means that you return a purchased item to the store 
for a refund. So let's say you bought a pair of shoes at the store, you come home and you realize they don't fit very well or you just don't really like them, well, you can take them back. So you go to the store, you return the shoes and you get your money back. Now, we only use this when you physically go to the store. So with online purchases, we actually don't use the phrasal verb take back. So if you order something from Amazon and you don't like it and you want a refund, we simply say, I returned the shoes I bought from Amazon or I sent back. I sent back the shoes. So just keep that in mind. We only use take back when you physically go to the store. You can also take someone back, which means you reunite a previous romantic relationship. So let's say that Rob and Julie were a couple last year, but then they broke up. They ended their relationship. But then Rob, he begs Julie, please take me back. Please accept me again as your romantic partner. Please take me back. But Julie's friend might say, don't take Rob back. Why would you take Rob back? You shouldn't take Rob back to take on. When you take on a project or a task, it simply means that you accept that project or task. For example, your boss might ask the team, who has time to take this on? Who has time to take on this new project or this new client? And you might say, I can take it on. I can take it on. So you accept that responsibility for that job. You can also take over a responsibility, a project, a task, which means that you assume responsibility from another person. So let's say Julie took on the project, but then Julie decided to go on a three week vacation. So your boss might ask you to take over. So the responsibility goes from Julie to you. Hey Maria, can you take over this project while Julie's on vacation? Or it can be, can you just take over this project? So it can be permanent, it becomes your project permanently, or it can just be a temporary situation while someone is sick or on vacation. To take someone out. When you take someone out, it means you invite them for an activity such as having a meal together or going to the movies together, but you pay for that activity. For example, let's say it's your birthday. Well, your husband, your best friend, your mother, your sister might take you out for dinner, which means they invite you for dinner and they also pay for dinner. That's the important part. Or they might take you out for a nice night at the movies and you go to the movies together or maybe to the amusement park. So you can do other activities, but it's mainly used with meals. So maybe your friend says, why would you take Rob back? Why would you take Rob back? He didn't even take you out for your birthday. Oh, he didn't invite you out for dinner and then pay for that meal. You can take up a new hobby or activity, which means you start that new hobby or activity. So you could tell your friends, I decided to take up karate, which means you decided to start karate lessons as a new hobby or activity. Or your friend might say, I didn't know you took up dancing. I didn't know you started dancing as a hobby or activity. Are you ready for your final quiz? Here are the questions. So go ahead and hit pause, complete the quiz, take as much time as you need. And when you're ready, hit play to see the answers. Here are the answers. So hit pause and review these answers to see how well you did.
Awesome job expanding your vocabulary with so many phrasal verbs. Now let's help you add some more advanced adjectives to your vocabulary. In this section, you're going to learn 100 advanced adjectives to describe personality. Let's get started. First, let's talk about sentence structure. Commonly, you can use to be plus adjective. Janice is nice. Of course, you need to conjugate your verb according to the subject. I am nice. Another common structure is to use adjective plus noun. I met a nice person. Notice the adjective comes directly before the noun, so it's article, adjective, noun. I met a nice person person. Pay attention to this sentence structure. I'll also teach you more advanced sentence structures in the different examples. Now let's get started with our 100 advanced adjectives starting from A all the way to Z. Adaptable. Adaptable. This is when you're willing and able to change to suit different conditions. So let's say one minute you're editing a report Next, you're leading a presentation. Next, you're analyzing financial information. So you're working and changing to do many different things. I'm very adaptable. Adept, adept. You're adept at something. Notice that preposition at. When you're adept at something, it means you're skilled at something. You're very good at something. I'm very adept at using SAP. Adventurous, adventurous. This is when you're willing to try new or different things. A job posting might say, we're looking for someone who's adventurous because this position requires traveling all over the world. So if you're adventurous, you can apply. Affectionate, affectionate. This is showing feelings of liking or love. She gave me an, an affectionate farewell. So a very loving farewell. I've summarized all 100 adjectives into a free lesson PDF that includes the adjective, the definition, and an example sentence. You can look in the description for the link to download the free lesson PDF. Ambitious. Ambitious. This is when you have a strong desire to become successful in your career or in life. I'm attracted to ambitious men. Does that describe you? Are you ambitious? Artistic, artistic. This is when you're able to create or enjoy art. Would you describe yourself as artistic? Assertive, assertive. When you're assertive, it means you're confident saying what you mean or what you feel without fear. I need to work on being more assertive. I need to work on saying what I want, saying what I feel without being afraid of what other people might think of me. I need to work on being more assertive. Attentive, attentive. When you're attentive, it means you're very helpful and you take care of others. I try to be very attentive to my students, which means I try to be very helpful. Authentic, authentic. This means that you're real, you're true. You're not pretending to be someone that you're not, you're authentic. Sometimes being authentic around others is difficult. Sometimes being the real you is difficult because you're afraid that people might judge you. Approachable, approachable. This describes someone who is friendly and easy to talk to. My goal is for all my students to describe me as approachable. Would you describe me as approachable, friendly, and easy to talk to? If so, put that in the comments. Jennifer, you're approachable. Balanced, balanced. This is when you consider all sides or opinions equally. Even though she's a Democrat, she's very balanced. 
she considers other sides and opinions other than democratic opinions. Bright, bright. This is another way of saying smart or intelligent or someone who learns quickly. My students are all very bright. I know you'll learn these adjectives very quickly because you're bright. Broad-minded, broad-minded. This is someone who is willing to accept different behaviors, different opinions, different lifestyles. Being broad-minded is important when you work with people from around the world. Candid, candid. When someone is candid, it means that they're honest and they tell the truth about a situation. To be candid, I left my job because I didn't like my boss. Cheerful. This is someone who is happy and positive. Cheerful. I try to surround myself with cheerful people. Chill. Chill. This is an informal adjective but commonly used and it describes someone who is relaxed, who isn't worried, isn't anxious, who's very chill. As I get older, I become more and more chill more relaxed. I don't stress as much. I'm not as anxious or worried. I'm chill. Are you chill? Put that in the comments if you are. I'm chill. Clever. Clever. This is another advanced way of saying smart or intelligent. Someone who learns quickly. She's a very clever student. Communicative. Communicative. This describes someone who is willing to talk to others and who is willing to share information. Did you notice that Julie wasn't very communicative at the meeting today? Compassionate, compassionate. This is someone who is very sympathetic to others, especially when others are in a difficult situation and they want to help that person. They're very compassionate. She's a compassionate reporter. Competitive, competitive. This describes someone who really wants to win and who enjoys competition. I am very competitive. Sometimes I'm a little too competitive because I love winning. What about you? Are you competitive? Charismatic, charismatic. This is someone who is well-liked and well-admired. And because of that, they're able to influence others easily. If you want to win the election, you need to be more charismatic. Consider it, consider it. This is when you care about and respect others. It was very considerate of you to change the meeting because you knew I had an appointment. Constructive, constructive. This is usually information or advice that's meant to help someone or help someone improve their performance. Can I give you some constructive criticism? Can I criticize you, but in a way that's meant to help you improve, help you improve your performance? Can I give you some constructive criticism? Coy, coy. When someone's coy, they intentionally don't reveal information because they want to make that information more engaging or interesting. She's being very coy about the party. So she's not sharing a lot of details about the party, but that makes you wonder about the party and want to know more. So it makes you interested in the party. She's being very coy about the party. Courageous, courageous. Someone who's courageous is able to control their fear or negative emotion in fearful or dangerous situations. It was very courageous of you to quit your job and go back to school in your 40s. Creative, creative. This is someone who produces or uses unique or original ideas. We're looking for someone who's creative. Curious, curious. This is someone who is interested in learning about the world around them. Being curious is a great quality when you're learning a language. Would you agree with that? If you agree, 
Put I agree in the comments. Dependable, dependable. This is someone deserving of trust and confidence. My assistant is very dependable. Determined, determined. When you're determined, you want something really badly and you're not willing to let anything or anyone stop you from getting the thing that you want. If you're determined, you'll become fluent. That's my promise to you. But it takes determination. You need to be determined. Direct. Direct. When someone's direct, it means they communicate in a way that says exactly what they mean in a very honest way without worrying about being judged or hurting someone's feelings. I like how our CEO is very direct even when delivering bad news. Dynamic. Dynamic. This is someone who has a lot of different ideas and who is very energetic and forceful. Has anyone ever told you that you're very dynamic? Easy going, easy going. This describes someone who is relaxed and who doesn't easily get upset. My new manager is way more easy going than my last one. Eclectic, eclectic. When something is eclectic, it consists of many different types, methods, or styles. I work with an eclectic group of students in the Finally Fluent Academy. So I work with many different types of students in the Finally Fluent Academy. Emotional, emotional. This is when you have and express strong feelings and emotions. John became very emotional at his retirement party. Energetic, energetic. This is when you have a lot of energy. Even though she's almost 80, my grandmother is very energetic. Enthusiastic, enthusiastic. This is when you have an interest in a particular subject and you're very eager to want to be part of that subject. I love how enthusiastic you are about our new plan. Extroverted, extroverted. This describes a person who enjoys being with other people and are very energetic when they're with other people. Although I'm not very extroverted, I love working in sales. Exuberant, exuberant. This describes someone who is very energetic and simply happy to be alive. She's an exuberant speaker, fearless. Fearless. Of course, this means you're free from fear. Good negotiators need to be fearless. Flexible. Flexible. This is when you're able to change or be changed based on the situation. My schedule is very flexible next week. Forgiving. Forgiving. This describes someone who forgives easily. I'm thankful I have a forgiving boss a boss who forgives easily. Fruitful, fruitful. This is something that produces good results. He had a fruitful career as a lawyer. So it says he was very successful in his career. He produced good results. Frank, Frank. This describes someone who is honest and sincere. Thank you for being frank with me. Now remember that Frank is the name of a man, so you could possibly say Frank is very Frank. So a man whose name is Frank is very Frank, which means he's very honest and sincere. Fun loving, fun loving. This is when you enjoy having fun and not being too serious. Although I'm the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, I'm also very fun-loving. Gregarious, gregarious. This is someone who likes being with other people. Being gregarious is an important quality of a nurse because if you're a nurse, you need to like being around other people and spending time with your patients. Genuine, genuine. This describes someone who is real and exactly what they appear to be. Her speech was genuine. Honorable, honorable. Notice that silent H, honorable. 
This is someone who's honest, silent H, honest and fair. She's an honorable boss and I respect her decision. Humble, humble. This is someone who's modest, who shows a low estimate of their own worth. Although she makes $2 million a year, she's very humble. So this means she doesn't act like she makes $2 million a year. She drives a regular car, lives in a regular house, wears regular clothes. She's humble. Handy, handy. Someone who is handy means they're really skilled with using their hands, especially when it comes to tools and repairing, fixing, or even making things. I am not very handy, which means I'm not very good at repairing or fixing things or making things using tools with my hands. What about you? Would you describe yourself as handy? Are you handy? Imaginative imaginative. This is someone who can easily think of new, creative, original, innovative ideas. Kamal is an imaginative designer. Inquisitive, inquisitive. This describes someone who wants to know about a lot of different things. Usually someone who's inquisitive asks a lot of questions. I love when my students are inquisitive about my lessons. So I love when my students ask questions. Impeccable, impeccable. This is something that is perfect, that has no mistakes, no errors, no flaws. Sylvia gave an impeccable performance. Intuitive, intuitive. When someone's intuitive, it means they can understand things but more based on emotions and feelings rather than facts or information. I'm very intuitive when it comes to hiring, which means when I hire someone, I trust the feeling I get about that person rather than the facts on their resume. So they might have this amazing resume, but when I'm talking to them, if I don't get a good feeling about that person, I'm not going to hire them, which means I'm very intuitive. I trust my intuition. I'm very intuitive. Ingenious, ingenious. This is very intelligent or skillful. The way you handled that situation was ingenious. Inviting, inviting. Someone who's inviting makes you feel very welcome in any new environment or situation. The new HR manager is very inviting. Jubilant, jubilant. This is feeling and expressing great happiness, usually because of a success. The fans were jubilant after the game. So they were very happy, which means the team won. The fans were jubilant. Keen, keen. This describes someone who is very willing and eager and wants something. She's very keen. She's already followed up with me. So maybe we had an interview yesterday and she already sent me an email asking if I needed to know anything else about her. She's very keen. Kind-hearted, kind-hearted. This is someone who really enjoys helping other people. My doctor is very kind-hearted. Lively, lively. This is someone who's full of energy and enthusiasm. My team is so lively today. Logical, logical. This means reasonable based on good judgment. You made a logical decision. Loyal, loyal. This is someone who provides support in any situation. Kirk is our most loyal manager. He's been with the company for 20 years. Laudable, laudable. This is something that deserves praise even though there was no success or little success. Your actions are laudable. So even though you didn't succeed or get the result you wanted, you still deserve praise, most likely because you acted in a very responsible way. Mature, mature. When someone's mature, it means 
They act in a way that's very well developed emotionally. Although Chirac is only an intern, he's very mature. So this suggests he acts in a way that makes him seem older because he's more well developed emotionally compared to his age. Meticulous, meticulous. This means very careful with close attention to detail. As a quality assurance professional, I need to be meticulous. Marvelous, marvelous. This is another way of saying very good, marvelous. They did a marvelous job for the new client. Nimble, nimble. This is someone who is quick and exact with either their movements or their thoughts. His nimble hands are perfect for repairing antiques. Antiques are very delicate, but he can move his hands in a very quick way. His hands are very nimble. Open-minded, open-minded. This describes someone who is willing to consider ideas or opinions that are different from their own. Doctors are becoming more and more open-minded. Optimistic, optimistic. This describes someone who is hopeful, who sees the good parts of a situation, or who believes that good will come from a situation. I'm optimistic that I'll pass my oral exam. I'm hopeful. Out of this world out of this world. This is something that's extraordinary, superb. Your design skills are out of this world. Outgoing, outgoing. This is someone who is friendly and energetic and finds it easy and enjoyable being with other people. Now that I feel confident with my English, I'm more outgoing at work. This is something a lot of students want to have. So definitely improve your English so you can be more outgoing. Pensive, pensive. When someone is pensive, it means they're thinking and they're usually quite quiet. They're thinking very seriously, they're pensive. Julie was very pensive during our presentation, which means she was quite quiet during the presentation and she was just thinking. Proactive, proactive. This means that you take action to change something rather than waiting for the situation to happen and then simply reacting to the situation. One of my best qualities is that I'm proactive. Perceptive, perceptive. This means that you're very good at noticing details and information that other people may not notice. We really appreciate your perceptive comments. So you provided information that nobody else thought of, but you were very perceptive. We appreciate your perceptive comments. Persistent, persistent. This is when you continue doing something in a determined way even when you face difficulties or challenges. When I'm solving a problem, I'm very persistent. Punctual, punctual. This means you arrive or you do something at the scheduled time, so it means not late. Thankfully, the contractors are very punctual. They say they'll be here at 9 a.m. and 9 a.m they're here they're very punctual qualified qualified this is when you have the skill the knowledge or the ability to do something specific ronnie is the most qualified accountant i know riveting riveting this means extremely interesting the speakers at the conference were all riveting renowned renowned this means you're famous for something specific. Maya Angelou is a renowned poet. So she's famous, but for something specific, poetry. She's a renowned poet. Ravishing, ravishing. This means extremely beautiful. You look ravishing in that dress. Or if you're a male, you look ravishing in that suit. Reverent, reverent. This is showing great respect or admiration. 
The reverent crowd became silent when she appeared on stage. So to show their respect and admiration, the crowd became silent. So we can say they're a reverent crowd. Self-reliant, self-reliant. This means that you rely on your own skills and abilities. When you work remotely, you need to be self-reliant. Sensible, sensible. This means having and using good judgment. I like working with Hamid. He's very sensible. Savvy, savvy. This means you have practical knowledge and skills. She's very savvy when it comes to marketing. And I'm sure you're familiar with the term tech savvy, which means you're very skilled and knowledgeable when it comes to technology, tech savvy. I'm very tech savvy. What about you? Are you tech savvy? Put that in the comments. I'm tech savvy. I'm not tech savvy. Supportive, supportive. This is giving encouragement and approval. As a teacher, I try to be very supportive to all my students. Sincere, sincere. This means honest, not false, not invented. Her apology was sincere. So she said, I'm sorry, and she said it in an honest way, not I'm sorry, where clearly she's not actually sorry. I'm sorry. Her apology was sincere. Straightforward, straightforward. This means honest and not hiding one's opinions. I love how straightforward Shirley is. Sage, sage. This means wise and we use it specifically with people who are wise because they're old and with their old age, they gain wisdom. They're very sage. The consultant has 20 years of experience so we can trust his sage advice. Steadfast, steadfast. This means staying the same for a long time, not changing, not losing purpose. Jose is a steadfast assistant. Tenacious, tenacious. This is when you're unwilling to accept defeat or unwilling to stop doing or having something. Felicity is a tenacious student. Thrilling, thrilling. This means very exciting. Fabio's plan for the company is thrilling. Tender, tender. This means gentle, loving, or kind. It's important to be tender when you're delivering bad news. Tactful, tactful. This is when you're careful not to say or do something that could upset others. Yusuf quit in a very tactful way. Upbeat, upbeat. This means positive with hope for the future. Marie is very upbeat about the proposal. Unrelenting, I like this one, unrelenting. This means extremely determined, never weakening or ending. I appreciate my parents' unrelenting support. Their support never weakens, it never ends, it's unrelenting. Versatile, versatile. This is when you're able to change easily from one activity to another, or when you can use one thing in many different ways. Brad Pitt is a versatile actor. So he's one actor, but you can use him in many different ways. Romance, comedy, action, drama. He's a versatile actor. Vibrant, vibrant. This means energetic, exciting, and full of enthusiasm. I love how vibrant my work environment is. Witty, witty. When someone's witty, it means they're funny, but in a very intelligent way. My pilot was very witty. Youthful, youthful. This means having qualities that are typical of young people. Her youthful enthusiasm makes coming to work more enjoyable. So maybe she isn't youthful, maybe she is 50 or 60 years old, but her enthusiasm, her energy is youthful. 
which is a very positive thing. So it's more enjoyable coming to work. Zealous, zealous. This means enthusiastic and eager. I appreciate how zealous she is. You are doing so awesome. Now, native speakers, we love using phrasal verbs. We love using advanced adjectives, and we also love using idioms. So now you're going to learn 150 common idioms that native speakers actually use. Now, throughout this section, you're going to see the idiom, you're going to understand the meaning, and you'll see an example sentence, and you'll see a picture to really help you remember these idioms. Let's get started. To play something by ear. This is when you make a decision in the moment rather than planning in advance. So let's say you're talking about your weekend and your husband or your friend says, what do you wanna do this weekend? And you might say, let's play it by ear. Let's decide as the weekend happens, not in advance. Let's play it by ear. To be all ears. We use this to say that you're ready to listen and you're paying full attention. So let's say you tell your boss you want to discuss something important about the project and your boss replies, I'm all ears, I'm all ears. To wake up on the wrong side of the bed. This is a great one. We've all done this. It's when you wake up in a bad mood. You wake up grumpy. So let's say you wake up, you go in the kitchen, and your wife, your husband says, oh, hi, honey, how are you? Would you like some coffee? What do you want for breakfast? And you're grumpy, uh, I don't care, uh, where's my phone? And you're being grumpy, well then your wife, your husband can say, well, someone woke up on the wrong side of the bed, and that's just to let you know you're being grumpy. To wing something. When you wing something, you perform a speech or presentation without planning in advance. So you definitely don't want to wing your IELTS exam, right? To make a mountain out of a molehill. A molehill is really small, a mountain is really big. So it's when you take a minor problem or issue and you make it seem really serious or severe. So let's say you got one question wrong on a test and you're acting like it's extremely serious. Someone could say, don't make a mountain out of a molehill. They're letting you know it's really not that bad. To be at a crossroads. This is when you have to make a really important decision that could impact your life. Let's say you've been a graphic designer for 10 years, but you're considering going back to school and changing careers and becoming a lawyer or a teacher. So you might say, I'm not sure if I want to be a graphic designer anymore. I'm at a crossroads because that decision will impact your life. To rain cats and dogs, this is when it rains heavily. So let's say your friend in a different city asks you, oh, did it rain last night? And it did, it rained heavily. You can say, yeah, it rained cats and dogs. To be on top of the world, this is when you're really, really happy. So let's say you got a new promotion, you can say, I'm on top of the world. To give someone the cold shoulder. This is when you ignore someone and you ignore someone on purpose, usually because you're mad at them, annoyed with them, they did something wrong or something to irritate you. So let's say your husband or your wife is ignoring you. You might say, why are you giving me the cold shoulder? It's another way of asking, why are you mad at me? What did I do wrong? Why are you giving me the cold shoulder? To sit on the fence. This is when you delay making a decision, usually because that decision is difficult and you don't want to make it. For example, I asked my boss for a promotion, but he's sitting on the fence. 
So he won't answer me. He won't say yes. He won't say no. He keeps just saying, oh, I need to think about it. I'll get back to you. He's sitting on the fence. To hit the nail on the head, this is when you accurately explain a problem or a situation. For example, you hit the nail on the head when you said we needed to reduce our costs. So you explain the situation accurately. To be as fit as a fiddle, this simply means you feel great, you have good health, you're in good shape. So maybe you could say, since I changed my diet and I'm eating more fruits and vegetables, I feel as fit as a fiddle. This is a great one, to get something out of your system. This is when you do something or you try something simply so you can move on. For example, let's say you've been talking about going skydiving for years and years. You research it, you look at different websites, you talk to people about it, but you've never actually done it. Someone might say, just go skydiving so you can get it out of your system. So once you do it, you can stop researching it, stop looking it up and just move on already. I like this one. Speak of the devil. Speak of the devil. This sounds negative because of devil, but it's not at all. This is used when you're talking about someone and they appear exactly as you're talking about them. This has happened, right? Let's say you're talking to a friend about your mutual friend, Bob, and you're talking about Bob. Oh, is Bob going to come to the party? Oh, I'm not sure, I haven't talked to Bob. And then your phone rings and guess what? It's Bob. And then you can say, speak of the devil. To give someone the benefit of the doubt, this is when you trust someone when they tell you something. So if a coworker is late and they call you and they say, I'm stuck in traffic, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's trust that he's actually stuck in traffic. No pain, no gain. This is a classic one. This is used to say that if you want results, real results, you have to be willing to work hard and get uncomfortable. So I might say, if you want to improve your public speaking skills, no pain, no gain. You have to be willing to get uncomfortable. Hang in there. This is a great one. It simply means don't give up. I know learning a language is hard, but hang in there. A penny for your thoughts? This is used to ask someone what they're thinking. So let's say your friend is just staring out the window and you probably are wondering, what are they thinking about? You can turn to your friend and say, a penny for your thoughts? It's not rocket science. Rocket science is complicated, right? But if we say it's not rocket science, this means it's not complicated. So I could say becoming a confident English speaker is not rocket science, it's not complicated, you just have to practice speaking. To let someone off the hook. This is a great one because it means that you don't punish someone for a mistake or a wrongdoing. So your boss could say, I know you came in late today, but I'm going to let you off the hook. I'm not going to punish you. To make a long story short, this is when you take a long and usually complicated story and you make it very simple by sharing it briefly. So you could say, long story short, we missed our flight. So there's a long story about why you missed your flight, but you don't explain those details. You just say, long story short, we missed our flight. Easy does it, easy does it. This is a way of saying slow down. So if your friend is at the gym and they're trying to do too many exercises with too much weight, you might say, easy does it, 
slow down. To go back to the drawing board. This is when you need to start over and create a new plan or strategy because the first one failed. So let's say you were trying to solve a computer problem, you came up with a strategy, it didn't work, and then you can say to your team, well, let's go back to the drawing board and try again. Once in a blue moon. This is an event that happens infrequently. For example, I only see Kara once in a blue moon, not very often. At the drop of a hat. This is a great one because it means without hesitation or instantly. For example, call me if you need anything and I'll be there at the drop of a hat. It means I'll come instantly if you need anything. So it's a really nice, reassuring thing to say to someone. To add insult to injury. This is when you take a bad situation and it becomes even worse. So let's say you're going out on a first date and your date showed up late. That's already a bad situation. But then to add insult to injury, your date forgot his wallet and you had to pay for both of you. To hit the sack, this means to go to bed. For example, I'm really tired, I'm going to hit the sack. The ball's in your court. This is used when you need to make the next decision or the next step. So I might say, we offered her a great promotion, so now the ball's in her court. So it's up to her to decide if she's going to accept the promotion or look for another job or do something else. To be or to go barking up the wrong tree. This is when you look in the wrong place or you accuse the wrong person. For example, if you think I lost your ring, you're barking up the wrong tree. You're accusing the wrong person. To get or to have your ducks in a row. This is when you're well prepared or well organized for something specific. So you might say, the conference was supposed to start 10 minutes ago. They should have gotten their ducks in a row. They should have been organized or prepared. To get or have the best of both worlds. This is when you enjoy the advantages of two very different things at the same time. She works in the city, but she lives in the country she gets the best of both worlds. The lion's share. This is the largest part or most of something. So you might complain, I did the lion's share of work on this project. To be on the ball. This is when you're performing really well. Wow, you completed all those reports already? You're on the ball. To pull someone's leg. This is when you're joking with someone. So we usually use this to reassure someone you're only joking. Don't get upset, I'm just pulling your leg. To pull yourself together. This is when you need to calm down. You regain your composure after being really upset or agitated, angry, annoyed, and then you calm down. So I might say, pull yourself together. It was a false alarm. So the alarm made you really agitated and I'm telling you to calm down. So far, so good. This is how you reply when you want to let someone know that everything is okay until now. How's the project going? So far, so good. To be the last straw. This is when you have no patience left for someone's errors or mistakes. So I might say, this is her fifth time being late this month. That's the last straw. No more patience for her mistakes. Time flies when you're having fun. This is used to say that you don't notice how long something takes because it's enjoyable. 
So you might look at your watch and say, oh wow, it's 1 a.m. already? And then someone could reply and say, yeah, time flies when you're having fun. To be bent, out of shape, this is used to say you're upset, you're angry. For example, Janice is bent out of shape because she has to work late tonight. To make matters worse. Matters in this sense means problems, to make problems worse. So I might say, I have to work tonight and to make matters worse, to make that situation even worse, I have an early appointment tomorrow. Don't judge a book by its cover. You've probably heard this one. It means that you shouldn't judge someone or something on appearance. For example, let's say I'm hiring people and I say I'm not going to hire him, look at his hair. <laughs> and then my colleague would say, well, don't judge a book by its cover, look at his resume. To fall between two stools. This is when something fails to achieve two separate objectives. So let's say you plan to watch a romantic comedy movie. That movie is supposed to be romantic and funny at the same time, a romantic comedy, two objectives. So you could say that movie fell between two stools. It wasn't romantic and it wasn't funny. To cost an arm and a leg. This is when something is exceptionally expensive. Now, airline tickets are usually expensive, but exceptionally expensive, even more expensive than usual. I might say my flight cost an arm and a leg. To cross a bridge when you come to it. This is used to remind someone that you only need to deal with the situation when it happens. So your friend might be concerned, what if I forget all my words during my IELTS speaking exam? And then you tell that friend, cross that bridge when you come to it. Worry about that problem when it happens. To cry over spilt milk. This is used when someone complains about a problem or a loss from the past. So let's say I had a party weeks ago and now I'm complaining, I can't believe John didn't come to my party. Well, my friend can say, don't cry over spilled milk. It was three weeks ago. Why are you still talking about it? Curiosity killed the cat. This is used to say that being inquisitive or asking a lot of questions can lead to an unpleasant situation. So let's say your husband or wife is planning you a surprise birthday party and you try to ask a lot of questions. What are we doing? Where are we going? Who's coming? Then your husband or wife can say, curiosity killed the cat, just to remind you don't ask so many questions. To miss the boat. This is when you lose an opportunity because you were too slow to take action. For example, the application deadline was last week. I missed the boat. To be on fire. This is to perform really well. Wow, your presentation was amazing. You were on fire. To spill the beans, this is when you reveal a secret when you shouldn't have revealed a secret. So let's say you're planning a surprise party for someone and then you tell everyone, don't spill the beans, don't reveal the secret. To be under the weather, this is when you feel unwell, when you feel sick. Oh. I'm a little under the weather today. A blessing in disguise. This is when something, a situation seems bad or unlucky at first, but it results in something positive at a later date. So let's say you get fired from your job. 
Obviously, that seems bad, maybe even unlucky. But later on, you get a job 10 times better. It pays better, you have a better boss, better coworkers, the location is better. Everything about this job is better. You can say, getting fired was a blessing in disguise. My new job is so much better. A dime a dozen. This is used to describe something that is common and not special. So you can say tech startups in Silicon Valley are a dime a dozen. They're very common, they're everywhere, and they're not very special. Everyone's a tech startup in Silicon Valley, a dime a dozen. To beat around the bush. This is when you avoid saying what you mean because it's uncomfortable or awkward. So let's say you want to end your romantic relationship with your partner. Your friend could tell you, don't beat around the bush. Be direct and tell that person you want to break up. Better late than never. So let's say you've been working with a company for 10 years and you finally got your first promotion after 10 years and you're telling your friend this and you're a little annoyed because you've been there for 10 years but your friend could say better late than never to remind you that yes it took 10 years but it's better than not having a promotion better late than never to bite the bullet I love this idiom. This is when you force yourself to do something difficult or unpleasant because it's necessary or inevitable. Inevitable means eventually you have to do it, so why not bite the bullet and do it now? For example, just bite the bullet and ask your boss for a promotion. Break a leg. This is a very common idiom that we use to say good luck, good luck, break a leg. But we especially use this before someone gives a performance, most commonly a theatrical performance, but when you're going for a job interview, you are in a sense performing. Or when you're doing your speaking exam for your IELTS, you are performing. So before your speaking exam, your friend, your partner could say, break a leg, which means good luck. To call it a day. When you call it a day, it means you stop working for that day, usually because time is up or because you've done enough work for that day and you're going to stop. For example, it's getting late, let's call it a day. Let's call it a day. So that means you can go home. To cut somebody some slack. So let's say there's this coworker who has been showing up late to work every day and not doing a very good job at work. They seem very distracted, they're not working very hard, they're not contributing. But that person's dad just died. So you might say, let's cut him some slack. His dad just died. So you're not going to punish him as severely as you normally would. To be glad to see the back of. This means that you're happy that somebody has left because you don't like them. So let's say it's Jane's last day at work. She quit, she has a new job, but you didn't like Jane. You can say, I'm glad to see the back of Jane. To be the best thing since sliced bread. This is a compliment used to say that something, usually technology or an invention, is extremely useful, excellent, or high quality. So you could give me a compliment and say, this YouTube channel is the best thing since sliced bread. 
If you think that's true, then put it in the comments. There are plenty of fish in the sea. So let's say your friend went on a date and she says, Pierre hasn't called me back and it's been three weeks. You can encourage your friend by saying, don't worry, there are plenty of fish in the sea. Come rain or shine. This is used to say that an event will take place despite external circumstances. So let's say tomorrow is a vacation day for you, but there's a big project deadline tomorrow. But you might say, I'm taking the day off tomorrow, come rain or shine, to cut corners. This is when you do something in the cheapest, easiest, or fastest way, but by omitting something or by not following rules. So you might say, we felt pressured to cut corners because of the tight deadline to get your act together. So your parents might say to you or your sibling or someone you know, you're 30 and you still live at home and you don't have a job. You need to get your act together. You need to organize yourself so you can live in, e in an effective and efficient way. Get your act together to break the ice. This is such an important one because this is used to help people who don't know each other to feel more comfortable around each other, especially when they're meeting for the first time. Let's break the ice by introducing ourselves and sharing something interesting about ourselves. Clear as mud. This is used to say that something is very difficult to understand. So if somebody gave you instructions, but their instructions didn't make any sense at all, and they ask you, so is everything okay? Do you understand? You can say clear as mud, which tells the person you do not understand at all. Crystal clear, something is very clear and easy to understand. His instructions were crystal clear. To rock the boat. This is when you do or say something that could upset people or cause problems. Don't rock the boat until the negotiations are done. So don't say anything that could upset someone or that could cause problems until we sign the deal. And then you can cause problems if you want to. To get out of hand, this is another way of saying to get out of control, which means you no longer have control over a situation. You could say the party got out of hand, which means you were no longer able to control it. The party got out of hand and some valuables were broken. A bad apple. This is used to describe a bad or corrupt person within a group. You could say, there are a few bad apples in the company. To cut to the chase. This is when you only talk about the most important points of a subject or topic. So if you're running out of time in, the, in a meeting, you might say, we're running out of time, so I'll cut to the chase. I'll only say the most important points. To come in handy. This is used when something is very useful for a specific purpose. So if it's pouring rain outside, you might say an umbrella would come in handy. An umbrella would be very useful in this particular situation. To reinvent the wheel. This is when you waste time trying to recreate something that somebody else has already created. So let's say you ask your boss, should I create a presentation for the conference? And your boss suggests using last year's presentation. It's already created. And your boss can add, don't reinvent the wheel. 
So we often use this idiom in the negative. To go with the flow. When you go with the flow, it means that you do what other people are doing or you agree with the opinion of others, the majority. So let's say you're having a company dinner and you originally wanted to have burgers, but the majority of people say they want pizza. So you can go with the flow and have pizza instead of burgers because that's what the majority wants. To be skating on thin ice. This is when you do something that is dangerous or involves risk. He's skating on thin ice by lying to his wife. It involves risk. It's dangerous. Don't do it. A silver lining. This is something positive that comes from something negative. So the pandemic is negative, right? But is there anything positive, a silver lining? Maybe we could say one silver lining of the pandemic is that it made us realize how important our relationships are with friends and family. To have a sweet tooth. This is somebody who likes eating sweet foods, especially chocolate. So if people offer me dessert, generally I'll say no because I don't like sweet food. So I could say, no, thank you. I don't have a sweet tooth, which means I don't really like sweet foods. To go Dutch. This is when you agree to share the cost of something, especially a meal. So let's say you're having dinner with a friend, family member, even a romantic partner, and they say, I'll pay for the meal. You could say, no, 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 let's go Dutch, which means you're going to divide the cost 50-50. To make ends meet. This is when you have just enough money to pay for essential items. You might say, with food prices increasing, we're barely making ends meet. To ring a bell. This is when something, usually a person, a place, or information is familiar to you. So let's say you're having a conversation with a coworker and they say, oh, have you met Fred from accounting? And you're thinking, Fred, Fred, Fred from accounting? That doesn't ring a bell. The tip of the iceberg. This is used to describe a small part of a much bigger problem. These small local protests are just the tip of the iceberg to blow off steam. This is when you say or do something that helps you release strong feelings or strong energy, strong emotion. After our fight, I went for a walk to blow off steam. So when you were on that walk, you were able to calm down, to release that negative energy. A piece of cake. This is something that was extremely easy. That exam was a piece of cake. To be out of the woods. This is when you no longer have a problem or difficulty. Our profits are increasing, but we're not out of the woods yet. To get over something. This is when you recover from an illness. It took me two weeks to get over that cold. To not be one's cup of tea. This is used to describe a type or category that you don't like. Thanks for the invite, but camping isn't my cup of tea. I don't like that category of activity. To be loaded. This means to be rich, to have a lot of money. I just found out my cousin's loaded. To nip something in the bud. This is to stop something before it has an opportunity to become established. We need to nip these rumors in the bud before the employees start worrying. Out of the blue. 
When something happens out of the blue, it happens suddenly and you weren't expecting it. My boss gave me a promotion out of the blue. You weren't expecting it. How awesome is that? To keep one's chin up. This is to remain cheerful in a difficult situation because in difficult situations, we tend to put our chin down, but when we're happy, we tend to keep our chin up. For example, I know the economy seems bad, but keep your chin up. To race against the clock. This is when you try to finish a task quickly before a specific time. I raced against the clock to finish the audit and meet the deadline. To catch somebody off guard. This is when you surprise somebody by doing something they weren't expecting or weren't prepared for. The politician was caught off guard when asked about the scandal. To be on one's radar. If something is on your radar, it means you're considering it or thinking about it or aware of it. You could say leaving the company isn't on my radar. It's not even something I'm considering. To stab someone in the back. This is to betray someone. To do something harmful to someone who trusted you. She told the client she did all the work on the project. I can't believe she stabbed me in the back like that. To make a beeline for something. This is when you move quickly and directly towards something. So let's say you're at a wedding or a conference and they're about to serve lunch, the buffet lunch. Everyone made a beeline for the food. They went quickly and directly to the food. To be in hot water. This is when you're in a situation where you might be criticized or punished. The politician's in hot water after his comments on gender equality. To be dressed to the nines. This is when you're dressed formally, smartly, or fashionably. We dress to the nines for our wedding anniversary. So you usually dress to the nines for a special occasion. To be between a rock and a hard place. This is when you're in a difficult situation or you have to make a difficult decision. If I accept the promotion, then I'll have to move abroad. And I know Matt, my partner, won't come with me. So I either accept the promotion that I really want, but then I have to lose Matt or I stay with Matt and I don't get the promotion. Hmm. I'm between a rock and a hard place. It's a difficult situation. It's a difficult decision. Lo and behold, this is an expression used to say that something surprising happened. I was on vacation in Japan and lo and behold, I saw my childhood sweetheart. So it's very surprising that I see my childhood sweetheart across the world in a foreign city. Lo and behold, to let the cat out of the bag. This is when you accidentally reveal a secret. So let's say you're planning a surprise party for your wife or husband or friend and they know about it. You might say, you know about the party, don't you? Who let the cat out of the bag? Who told you? Who revealed the secret? Who let the cat out of the bag? To be on the same page. This is used when all people agree on something and that something is generally a plan or how to approach something. For example, before we launch the product, we need to get everybody on the same page. So we need to make sure that all the different people agree on the plan to launch the product. To sell like hotcakes. I love this idiom. This is used when something sells very quickly, easily, or in large quantities, large amounts. 
For example, her new book sold like hotcakes. So this is a very good idiom. To fall through the cracks or to slip through the cracks. This is used when something is not noticed or something does not have sufficient attention. And remember, you can use two different verbs, fall or through, and both have the same meaning and they're both very common. For example, I'm sorry I forgot to send you the report. It slipped through the cracks. It fell through the cracks. So I just didn't notice it. I didn't pay enough attention to it. To be up in arms. This is a great one as well because we use it when someone is grumpy or angry about something specific. For example, Julie is up in arms because we have to stay late tonight. So Julie is angry or grumpy because of something specific. We have to stay late tonight. She's up in arms. Fair and square. This means honestly or according to the rules. So let's say my team lost a competition, but we deserve to lose. The other team played better than us. I can say they beat us fair and square. Honestly, according to the rules, they won fair and square. To be a black sheep. This is when a member of a group is different from the other members. And we often use this with family. For example, all my cousins are married and have kids, except Tom. Tom is the black sheep. He's different from all the other members of the group, in this case, family. By the skin of one's teeth. This means barely or by a very slight margin. We won by the skin of our teeth. So we won by only by this much, not very much. To get under one's skin. And this is to irritate or upset someone. For example, I don't know why, but Jerry really gets under my skin. Jerry really irritates me. He upsets me. To draw the line. This is when you put a limit on what you will allow or what you will do. For example, I want to help my sister, but I draw the line at lending her money. So that is what I will not do. I will not lend her money. That is not allowed. To give something a whirl. This is a fun one. It simply means to try something new. For example, you should give bowling a whirl. It's really fun. So if I know you've never gone bowling before, I could say you should try it. You should give it a whirl. To be a fish out of water. This is used to say that someone is in an unfamiliar and uncomfortable surrounding. For example, I feel like a fish out of water when I go to English meetings because you have to speak in English and that's unfamiliar and uncomfortable. You feel like a fish out of water. To go the extra mile. This is when you make an extra attempt to achieve something or do something. For example, she's a great assistant. She always goes the extra mile. So she does more than she needs to. To not see the forest from the trees. This is a very popular one. This is when you're so involved in the small minor details of something that you don't see the bigger picture. You don't see the forest from the individual trees. For example, the project failed because we couldn't see the forest from the trees. We lost track of the bigger picture. Straight from the horse's mouth. This is when you get information directly from the source of that information. I heard straight from the horse's mouth that we're not getting bonuses this year. To cry wolf. This is when you call for help 
but you don't actually need help. So in the future, nobody will assist you because you lied about needing help. For example, I'm not surprised nobody responded to her email. She always cries wolf. So she always asks for help when she doesn't need it. But then one day she does need help, but nobody will help her because she cries wolf. To have bigger fish to fry. This is when you have other more important matters to deal with. For example, can you attend my meeting this afternoon? I have bigger fish to fry. So I have a meeting that's dealing with more important things than this other meeting. To play devil's advocate. This is when you argue against something, even if you think the opposite, simply to address all sides of a situation. For example, it would be great to get a promotion, but to play devil's advocate, it would mean longer hours. So you actually want the promotion, but you're going to examine the other side just to be complete. To steal one's thunder. This is a very popular one. This is to prevent someone from getting the recognition, praise, or success that they deserve. And you do that by saying exactly what that person was going to say. For example, she announced her engagement at my engagement party. She stole my thunder. So I should have received the praise, the congratulations at my engagement party. But she announced her engagement, so now everybody is congratulating her. She stole my thunder. To rain on one's parade. This is to spoil someone's pleasure or special moment. Let's say my friend is very happy because she got an A on the exam. I could say, I hate to rain on your parade, but everyone got an A. So I'm spoiling her pleasure by saying that everybody got the exact same grade. To be a cakewalk, a cakewalk. This is when something is very easy or effortless. For example, learning English is a cakewalk, right? Would you agree? To take a rain check. This is when you decline an invitation by suggesting you'll accept that invitation at a future time. So not now, but later. Let's say somebody invites me to lunch today, but I'm very busy. I could say, I'd love to have lunch, but I need to take a rain check, which means not today, but later to go on a wild goose chase or to be on a wild goose chase. You can use either verbs, go or be. This is when you're looking for something specific, but it's a complete waste of time because that something specific doesn't exist. For example, after hiking for five hours, we realized we were on a wild goose chase because the waterfall doesn't exist. So we were looking for a specific waterfall, but on the trail we were on, there is no waterfall. The waterfall is at a completely different location. So we were on a wild goose chase because we're looking for something that doesn't exist. To twist someone's arm. This is when you persuade someone to do something that they don't want to do. For example, I didn't want to go to the party, but Sarah twisted my arm. So Sarah persuaded me, convinced me to go to the party. To face the music. This is when you accept criticism or punishment for something you did do. 
For example, I missed the deadline, so now it's time to face the music. Now I have to meet with my boss. We both know I missed the deadline. It was wrong, so I am going to be punished and I deserve it. It's time to face the music. To hit the books. This means to study or do homework. For example, I can't go to the party tonight. I need to hit the books. To turn a deaf ear. This is when you ignore someone when they complain or they ask for help. For example, I asked Maria to extend the deadline, but she turned a deaf ear. So when I asked her to extend the deadline, I was asking her to help me, but she ignored me. She turned a deaf ear. To break the bank. This means to cause financial ruin. For example, this vacation costs $5,000. It's expensive, but it won't break the bank. It won't cause financial ruin. To jump the gun. This is when you do something too soon without thinking about it carefully. For example, the company jumped the gun when they canceled the conference. So they made that decision too soon. They should have thought about it more, took more time, and then decided. To read between the lines. This is when you try to understand somebody's real feelings or intentions based on what they said or they wrote. For example, she said she's happy, but if you read between the lines, it's obvious she's upset. So you try to interpret what she's saying to really understand how she feels. Through thick and thin. This is when you support someone or stay with someone, even when there are problems or difficulties. For example, a true friend will be there through thick and thin. If there are problems or difficulties, a true friend will be there. To go back to square one. This is to start working on a plan from the beginning because your previous attempt failed. For example, the board didn't approve our plan. So we have to go back to square one. We have to start again from the beginning. From scratch. This is from the very beginning. For example, I started this YouTube channel. For example, my family started this business from scratch. So when we started, there was nothing. We did everything ourselves from scratch. To shoot oneself in the foot. This is when you say or do something that could cause problems for you. For example, I shot myself in the foot when I agreed to stay late tonight. So I said yes when my boss asked me to stay late, but it's my cousin's birthday. So now I can't go to their party or I'm going to be late and I'm going to be in trouble. I shot myself in the foot. Right off the bat. This means at the very beginning or immediately. For example, you can't expect to feel confident speaking right off the bat. So immediately, at the very beginning, when you first start, that's right off the bat. You can't expect to feel confident right off the bat. In the bag. This is when something is certain to be won, achieved, or obtained. For example, Jane has the promotion in the bag. So even though they haven't formally announced that Jane has the promotion, it's certain that it's hers. She has it in the bag. Hot air. This is a great one. This is when something is not sincere and will not have practical results. For example, the advertisement claimed I would lose 20 pounds in 20 days, but 
It was hot air. It was not true. To follow in someone's footsteps. This is when you do the same thing that someone else previously did. And that someone else is usually a family member, a friend, or a mentor. For example, she followed in her father's footsteps and became an engineer. This means that her father is also an engineer. To call a spade, a spade. This is when you tell the truth about something, even if the truth is not pleasant and not polite. For example, let's call a spade a spade. This company discriminates against women. So that's not a very polite thing to say, but it's the truth. To be in the same boat. This is when you're in the same situation as someone else, and that situation is difficult. For example, we both lost money in the stock market. We're in the same boat. To pick someone's brain. This is when Someone has a lot of information on a subject or topic and you ask them to share that information or you ask them for their opinion. You pick their brain. For example, I'd love to buy you coffee and pick your brain sometime, which means I'd love to buy you coffee and find out what you know, ask you questions about what you know, or get your opinion on a specific topic based on your knowledge. To bounce an idea off someone. This is when you share an idea to get feedback on that idea. For example, can I bounce a few ideas off you before the meeting today? The devil's in the details. This is used when something seems simple, but the details are complicated and could cause problems. For example, the contract is only one page, which seems simple, but the devil's in the details. So in that one page, there's a lot of complicated information that could cause problems. The pot calling the kettle black. This is used to say that someone shouldn't criticize someone else for a fault that they have in themselves. Let's say Jack is always late and I get to our meeting five minutes late and Jack gets mad at me for being late, but he's always late. So I could say, I can't believe Jack was mad because I was five minutes late. Talk about the pot calling the kettle black. To take a back seat. This is when you choose to not have responsibility in a organization or an activity. For example, my team is organizing a conference, but I'm taking a back seat. I'm not going to be responsible for the conference. To be up for grabs. This is a great one. It's used when something is available and ready to be won or taken. For example, do you know if Sue's office is up for grabs? So Sue's office is now empty. Maybe she left the company or she changed offices. So is her office ready and available? Is it up for grabs? To put something on ice. This is when you delay something or you reserve something for future use. Let's put the conference on ice until the summer. To bite off more than you can chew. This is when you try to do something that is too difficult for you. For example, we took on three projects this month. I think we bit off more than we can chew. So three projects is too difficult for us. To throw caution to the wind. This is when you do something without worrying about the risk or the negative consequences. For example, I wasn't happy at my job, so I threw caution to the wind and I quit. So I didn't think about the negative consequences when I made that decision. I threw caution to the wind. A cross to bear. 
This is an unpleasant or painful situation or person that you have to accept, even though it's very difficult for you to do so. For example, I lost our company's biggest client, and that's my cross to bear. So that's a very painful situation, knowing that I was personally responsible for this loss, but that's my cross to bear. I have to accept it and deal with that, even though it is painful. And finally, to keep one's eye on something or someone. This is when you watch something or you take care of something or someone. For example, will you keep an eye on the project while I'm at the conference? Will you take care of the project? Will you watch the project while I'm at the conference? You're doing such an amazing job. Think of everything you've learned so far. Now, I know that last section was a big one. This one, is smaller and you're going to learn the most common advanced medical vocabulary that you need because we all need to know medical vocabulary. So let's get started with this section right now. Let's talk about a patient. A patient is a person receiving medical care. We will all be patients at some point in our life and I'm sure all of us have already been patients on numerous occasions. Now, right now, I'm not a patient, even though I have a doctor, I'm not a patient because currently I'm not receiving medical care. This only applies when you're in the process of receiving medical care. There are two types of patients. You can be an inpatient, which means you're admitted to the hospital to receive care. If you're an inpatient, you're going to be at the hospital for a night, a week, or even longer. You have a hospital room and a hospital bed. Many inpatients are in an area of the hospital called the ICU. This stands for the Intensive Care Unit, the ICU. And this is where inpatients go to receive a high level of care. You can also be an outpatient, which most of us usually are, which means you receive care without being admitted to the hospital. You are an outpatient when you go to the ER, which is the emergency room. You're there to receive care for a specific treatment or illness. They treat you and then you leave. You don't stay overnight at the hospital. Now let's talk about common medical professionals you need to know. Of course, you already know doctor, also known as a physician. In North America, it's more common to simply say doctor, but it means the same thing. Most of us have a GP, which stands for a general practitioner. This is a doctor who treats a wide range of issues. So you can go to your GP because you have a pain in your back or because you have a cold or a throat infection or an eye issue, a wide range of issues, you can go to your GP. A surgeon is of course a doctor who performs surgery. There are also many specialists and this is a doctor who focuses on one specific medical area, a cardiologist focuses on your heart. A dermatologist focuses on your skin. A pediatrician focuses on children. And in North America, whenever you go to a pediatrician, at the end, they always give you a sucker because kids are always scared of going to the pediatrician, which is a doctor for children. So they treat you with a sucker or a small treat after. An optometrist, focuses on your eyes. If you wear glasses, you frequently go to your optometrist. A dentist, of course, focuses on oral health and your teeth. An OBGYN. I have no idea what this stands for. I know it's a very long word, but everyone just says OBGYN. An OBGYN is a doctor specifically for women, 
when you're pregnant or to discuss reproductive issues. An anesthesiologist. Don't let this spelling confuse you. Native speakers have difficult with the pronunciation of this. Anesthesiologist. Anesthesiologist. An anesthesiologist administers anesthesia, which is what makes you go unconscious before surgery. They also monitor you during surgery. A radiologist does the x-rays, CT scans, and MRIs. A psychiatrist focuses on your mind and mental disorders. Fun fact, both of my neighbors are doctors. One is a GP and the other is a psychiatrist. So if I need any help, both physically and mentally, I'm covered. And an ENT stands for ear, nose, and throat. So that doctor, an ENT, focuses on those three things, ear, nose, and throat. There are more specialists, but these are the most common. Of course, nurses are just as important as doctors. You can be a registered nurse, an RN. This means you have a nursing degree and you have a license in the specific area where you are a nurse. You can also be a nurse practitioner, an NP, which means you have more advanced training and you can diagnose and treat specific medical conditions. Let's talk about a routine checkup. This is something that all of us do, hopefully every six months or one year. And this is when you see your GP, your general practitioner, just to review your overall health. So you don't have a specific medical issue. It's just a routine appointment. We call that a checkup, a routine checkup. During that routine checkup, your GP, general practitioner, is going to examine your vital signs. Your vital signs include your temperature, your heart rate, and your blood pressure. Now you can also discuss any specific medical issues that you're having with your GP during the routine checkup. Of course, you can schedule an appointment at a separate time for a specific medical issue. If you are discussing a specific medical concern or issue with your GP, it's possible that they'll refer you to a specialist. For example, your GP could say, I'm going to refer you to an ENT. Remember, that's ear, nose, and throat. That's what the doctor specializes in. When you see the specialist, or even when you're with your GP, you're going to talk about your symptoms. A symptom is any feeling of illness that you're currently having or that you've had in the past that you want to discuss with your GP or the specialist. And when you're talking to the doctor, one of the very first things they'll say is, what are your symptoms? What are your symptoms? And then you simply tell the doctor what's wrong, what you're feeling that isn't right. For example, I have a lot of back pain, my left arm is sore, my feet are numb, which means you can't feel your feet. If they're numb, you can't feel them. My vision is blurry, which means you can't see very well. Or you could say, I feel nauseous. Nauseous? That's the feeling you get when you're on a roller coaster. I feel nauseous. Those are just some symptoms you may be experiencing. You can experience or have a symptom. There are, of course, many, many other symptoms that you could have and that you would discuss with your GP or specialist. After listening to your symptoms, the doctor might want to do some diagnostic tests. These are tests or an exam to determine the existence or the absence of a specific medical condition, disease, or illness. Common examples of diagnostic tests are an MRI, 
an x-ray or a CT scan. After these diagnostic tests, the doctor will have a diagnosis, which is a judgment about what the illness or medical problem is. Then you can discuss the treatment options. These are the different courses of action that you can take to address the medical issue or the different treatments available. If the treatment option includes medication, well then the doctor will write you a prescription. A prescription is a written order or in our modern world, most likely an electronic order for a specific medical treatment like a drug or a specific pill. You can take your prescription to a pharmacy because at the pharmacy, of course, there'll be a pharmacist and a pharmacist fills the prescription, which just means they provide you with the medical treatment. On the prescription, it will tell you what the dosage is, and this is information the pharmacist needs. The dosage is the amount or quantity of the medical treatment like a specific drug. So how much of that drug are you getting and what is the quantity of the active drug in each pill that you get? That's the dosage. The pharmacist will also talk about any side effects. So the side effects of a specific medical treatment, those are the unintended consequences. So if you take a pill, it might cause headaches but it's trying to treat your sore arm, but then it causes a headache. So that's the side effect of the pill. Any unintended consequences or adverse reactions, those are the side effects. And then later you can schedule a follow-up appointment with your GP or specialist to discuss if your symptoms have been relieved at all, if the course of action, the treatment is working, if there needs to be any changes to the dosage, a different prescription, you can discuss all of that with your GP or specialist at a follow-up appointment. Amazing job. Now let's get you prepared for your next job interview. In this section, you're going to learn all the vocabulary that you need to sound fluent, sound professional, and sound natural at your next job interview. Are you ready to add 50 plus advanced expressions to your vocabulary that you can use when you're attending a job interview in English? Let's get started with the first question that you're going to be asked. Tell me about yourself. When you're asked this question, you absolutely must use the expression, I have more than, over, or almost 10 years of experience. And then you can add as a, and your job title, as a project manager, as an accountant. Don't forget that article. It's very important that it's there before your job title. Now you can also talk about your experience in a particular field. I have almost 20 years of experience in the project management industry. I have more than 15 years of experience in the IT sector. So you can use field, industry, or sector. Now notice you have more than or over. That's when the number is greater than. And then you have almost. That's when the number is less than. So if you actually have 13 or 14 years of experience, well, it sounds better to use a round number like 15. So you can say almost 15 years of experience if you have 13 or 14. Now you can add to this and tell us more about your responsibilities in that role. So you can say in this role, which is your role as a financial analyst in this role, you could also say in that role, it doesn't matter in this, that role I was responsible for, or you can say I am responsible for was if you're viewing the role as complete and I am responsible for if you're currently doing that role. 
I was responsible for. Now, after this, we need a gerund verb. So you can use many, many different verbs to talk about your experience. These are the most common verbs you can use. In this role, I was responsible for managing, overseeing, leading, coordinating, creating, developing, reviewing, improving, streamlining, and analyzing. Of course, you can use other verbs, but these are the most common. Now, streamlining, this means improving the efficiency or effectiveness. So as a financial analyst, you could say, I have over 20 years of experience as a financial analyst in the IT industry. In this role, I'm responsible for overseeing a team of 15 people and I'm responsible for streamlining our operations. Now, in a job interview, you absolutely want to use more academic or formal adjectives. You don't want to say, I have a lot of experience. That doesn't sound very strong or convincing. It sounds a lot more impressive if you say, I have extensive experience. I have significant experience. So those are two must know adjectives that you should use in job interviews, extensive and significant, which simply is a more formal way of saying a lot of. I have significant experience. And again, after this, you need a gerund verb. You can use any of the verbs I've already shared. And of course, you'll have specific verbs for your industry and your specific job title. I have extensive experience creating international marketing campaigns for a variety of industries. Now, after this expression, I have significant extensive experience, you could also use a noun. I have significant project management experience. I have significant financial analysis experience. So you don't have to use a gerund verb, you could also use a noun. If you're asked about your education or your credentials, you can simply say, I have a bachelor of, I have a bachelor of science, a bachelor of arts, a bachelor of engineering, whatever that may be. Now you can end it there, but you may also choose to identify the school and the year you graduated. Those aren't requirements, but if you went to a prestigious or well-known school or you recently graduated, those might be useful details to include. I have a Bachelor of Science from Cornell. I graduated in 2020. You could also use the verbs received or obtained, which are more formal than have. However, it's extremely common to use the verb have. I have a bachelor, I have a master, but you can absolutely use received or obtained to use the more formal version. I received my master of education from Cornell in 2020. I obtained my master of engineering from MIT in 2019. If your credential is a certification, you can use the verbs, I received, I completed, or I obtained. I completed my PMP in 2019. Now notice here I use an acronym, PMP. If I'm applying for a job in the project management industry, they know what a PMP is. It's the most prestigious certification in the industry. It stands for Project Management Professional. So there's no need to identify an acronym if that acronym is well known in your specific industry. Let's talk about your personal strengths. The interviewer is likely going to ask you, what are your strengths? What would you say are your three best qualities? So here you can use a transition word, as for my strengths, as for my strengths, that's just to introduce the point, as for my strengths, I'm extremely, and then you can list the quality. 
Now notice here I use the adjective extremely. This is a more convincing adjective than I'm really or very. You want to avoid those common adjectives because they don't stand out and it's way more convincing to use a stronger adjective in a job interview like extremely. I'm extremely hardworking, which sounds stronger than I'm really hardworking. Let's review some common adjectives that you're going to use. And for all of these adjectives, you're going to use the verb to be and then list the adjective. I'm extremely hardworking, committed, trustworthy, honest, focused, methodical, proactive, a team player. For a team player, you can't use an adjective. You're simply going to say, I'm a team player. You're not going to say, I'm extremely team player. That doesn't work. I'm a team player. Now let's talk about some specific skills you should highlight in your interview. Now the following skills are rated as the top 10 skills that employers want. Of course, the skills are specific to your industry, but you can take this as a general list of skills that would be useful to highlight during the interview. And to talk about these skills, you can say, I have, and for an adjective, you can say, I have advanced, I have superior, I have excellent, and then you list the skill. I have excellent time management skills. I have superior communication skills. I have advanced adaptability skills. The other top 10 skills are problem solving, teamwork, creativity, leadership, interpersonal skills, attention to detail, and work ethic. For work ethic, we have a very specific adjective, and that's strong. I have a strong work ethic. So this is the specific expression for work ethic. I have a strong work ethic. So let's say you want to show off your communication skills. I have superior communication skills. Now let's say the interviewer wants to know why you're interested in this specific position. You could say, I'm looking for an opportunity to further or to develop my X skills. So your project management skills, your teamwork skills, your financial analysis skills, whatever the specific skill is. You could also say, I'm looking for an opportunity to gain experience in, and then you can talk about a specific field, industry, or sector in the IT industry, in the project management field, in the marketing sector. You should absolutely have a conclusion. Don't just say, Thank you for your time. You should leave them with a really strong impression of your skills and your ability to complete the job and be an asset to the organization. So you can say, I believe that, I know that, I'm confident that my extensive project management skills would make me a valuable asset to your company, your team, your organization. And I look forward to the opportunity to contribute to your goals. Of course, you should take this and adapt it to your specific industry or role, but you absolutely want a strong conclusion statement to impress the interviewer. You are doing such a great job and this is your last section, but it's a very important section because in this section, you're going to learn over 50 transition words. Transition words are so helpful to sound advanced in English, but they're also helpful to take a simple idea, expand on it and make it more complex. So really pay attention to this section. Let's get started. So what exactly are transition words? 
Well, transition words are individual words or groups of words, phrases, that you can use to organize your ideas and to show connection between your ideas. They're commonly used in academic or formal writing, but you shouldn't limit their use to just that because you can absolutely use them in your spoken English and you should use them in your spoken English to sound very advanced and professional. And if you watch to the end of this video, I'm going to share how you can use transition words to expand your ideas and to take a really simple idea and be able to talk on that idea for longer using transition words. So stay right to the end. So let's get started. You're going to learn over 50 transition words in this lesson. Don't feel overwhelmed. Just add them to your vocabulary as you go. Our first group of transition words are used to show cause and effect causation. So here I have two separate ideas. I spilled my coffee. I changed my shirt. Now this is where we can use a transition word to combine these ideas together and to show the relationship between them. I spilled my coffee. As a result, I changed my shirt. Cause and effect. Here are the transition words in this category and they're listed from most formal to least formal. So you can take a screenshot of this. Consequently, hence, accordingly, thus, for that reason, as a result, therefore, and so, since, because, due to. Now the example I gave you, I spilled my coffee, as a result, I changed my shirt. This is a casual statement. It might sound a little odd, perhaps out of place, to use a very formal transition word, such as consequently, in such a common everyday speech. I spilled my coffee, consequently, I changed my shirt. You could absolutely say it, it's grammatically correct, but the choice of transition word is just a little too formal. So do not think that formal is the best and you absolutely should use formal. You should use formal when your ideas are more formal. They're more academic. They're more professional in a business context. Let's look at a business context. The project is over budget. We have to cut costs. So again, we'll show our cause and effect. We'll use a transition word to combine these ideas. And because it's a more formal context, I can use a more formal transition word. The project is over budget, hence, consequently, thus, we have to cut costs. Our next group of transition words is chronology. This is how events are related based on when they occur. So think of time. Here are three events. I went to the store, I worked out, I made dinner. Now, of course, we can add first, second, third, first, next, finally, that's chronology and it instantly sounds more organized and more advanced when you add the transition words. So let's review the transition words in this category. First, firstly, to start, to begin, at the beginning, at the start. Second, secondly, after, afterwards, next, then, subsequently, later. Third, thirdly, after, afterwards, next, then, subsequently, later, finally, lastly, last but not least. Now notice that for the second and third events, many of the transition words are the same. You can use after, after for the second and third event, or you can use next, next for the second and third and fourth and fifth event. But you might want to avoid that so you don't sound repetitive using the same transition word again and again. So you can use next, then, then, subsequently, subsequently, finally. So you can use the different transition words just to show off your advanced vocabulary. Our next category of transition words is to show contrast when you have two opposing ideas. Let me give you two ideas. I love ice cream. 
I'm lactose intolerant. So can you see how these two ideas are in opposition? I love ice cream is great. It's a really positive thing, but I'm lactose intolerant. That's negative and it also means that I can't eat ice cream. So those ideas are in opposition. So we can use our contrasting transition words. However, although, though, but. I love ice cream, but I'm lactose intolerant. Same thing, the transition words are listed from most formal to least formal. Again, you could say, I love ice cream, however, I'm lactose intolerant, but again, these ideas are quite simple, so you probably want a more simple transition word. Our next category of transition words is addition of similar ideas. I love ice cream, I love cake. It's adding a similar idea because they're both in the same category, which is desserts or sweets. The most common transition words from most formal to least formal in this category are furthermore, moreover, further, additionally, in addition, also, and. I love ice cream and I love cake. Obviously, you know that one. So why not try to advance your vocabulary by using in addition? I love ice cream. In addition, I love cake. Now let's talk about generality. This is when things are true most of the time. The most common transition words in this category are in general, generally, generally speaking, by and large, for the most part, most of the time, more often than not, usually, typically, mostly. So let's take an example. Our meetings are very productive. Now, of course, I'm sure there's one or two meetings that aren't very productive, but most of the time, in general, generally speaking, our meetings are very productive. Now let's look at the category of examples. There are really only three main transition words. For example, as an example, for instance. This software has really helped us. Now it can make your point a lot stronger or help you expand on your idea by adding an example. This software has really helped us. For example, as an example, for instance, it reduced our error rate by 40%. Our next category is emphasis. This category is used to make a point stronger by adding more supporting information. Let's take a simple example. I love pie. Now, what if I wanted to make this point stronger? I could say, it's my favorite dessert. I love pie. In fact, it's my favorite dessert. I love pie. As a matter of fact, it's my favorite dessert. These are the only two transition words that are commonly used to add emphasis. And finally, conclusion transition words. Notice I just used a transition word. And finally, that is a conclusion transition word. Now, of course, in this category, we use these transition words when we want to end what we're saying, end our speech, end our presentation. Here are the most common transition words listed from most formal to least formal. In conclusion, to conclude, to summarize, in sum, all things considered, finally, overall, ultimately, in the end, to wrap up, to sum up, all in all. So let's say I'm ending my presentation at work and I want my colleagues to remember one very important fact. And that fact is, if we want to remain competitive, we have to invest in automation. Now to let my colleagues know that this is the last point I'm going to make, my final point, I'm going to add a conclusion transition word. Ultimately, if we want to remain competitive, we have to invest in automation. So now you have 50 plus transition words to help you communicate your ideas in a very professional and organized way. Before you go, let me share a bonus tip with you. You can use transition words to help you expand on your ideas. So let's take one idea. In general, our meetings are very productive. 
Now I can pick any category of transition word to expand on this idea. I could add a contrast. However, they usually run over time. So this is an opposing idea. Now, let me give an example of my last point to add emphasis and to expand even more. For example, today our meeting was scheduled to end at 11 and it went until 11.17. So let's expand on this even more. What was the effect of the meeting running over by 17 minutes? As a result, I was late for a meeting with a client. Hmm, were there any other effects? If there were, I could use an addition of a similar idea transition word. Additionally, I had to work through lunch to catch up. Congratulations, you did an amazing job. Think of all the vocabulary that you now have to express your ideas fluently, confidently, and naturally amazing job. And as your reward, you can download this free speaking guide where I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. You can click here to download it or look for the link in the description. And there is always something more to learn, so why don't you keep improving your English with this lesson right now?